on this meeting to order, and I'm going to have a reading of the special uh, session. Honorable members of City Council, on March 12, 2020, Governor Northam declared a state of emergency due to COVID-19. Because of the catastrophic nature of the declared emergency, it is impractical and unsafe to assemble a quorum of the City Council in a single location. In accordance with the Virginia Beach City Code 2-21, Virginia Code 2.2-3708-2A3, Virginia Code 15-2-1413, and the uh, City's uh, Continuity of Government Ordinance adopted on March 31st, 2020, and by the authority vested in me as Mayor of the City of Virginia Beach, I call for a special meeting by electronic communication means of the Virginia Beach City Council. Tuesday, May 5th, 2020, 4 p.m. In accordance with Virginia Code 2.2-3708.2A3, this special meeting by electronic communication means will be held virtually with City Council members present via video uh, conference. The purpose of this special meeting is for the City Council to receive briefings regarding the COVID-19 update City Council discussion moving forward with delayed planning agenda items and possible additional former meeting dates. Council reconciliation of the fiscal uh, 2020 and 21 resource management plan, as well as consider the item listed on the printed agenda. This special meeting will be broadcast on cable TV, www.vbgov.com, and Facebook Live. Citizens are encouraged to submit their conference to the City Council prior to the special meeting via email at citycouncil at vbgov.com. But sincerely, Robert M. Dyer, Mayor. Okay, at this point, uh, could we call for the uh, roll, call, uh, roll call vote? Yes, Mayor. Roll call. Jessica, Council Member Jessica Abbott. Present. <laughs> Council Member Michael Berlucci. Present. Council Member Barbara Henley. Present. Council Member Lewis Jones. Present. Council Member John Moss. Again. Council Member John Moss. Present. Council Member Guy Tower. Council Member Aaron Rouse. Present. Council Member Rosemary Wilson. Here. Council Member Sabrina Wooten. Aye. Vice Mayor Jim Wood. Present. Mayor Dyer. Present. All present, Mayor. Okay, at this uh, point, Madam Clerk, will you provide the structural rules and guidance? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of Council. This is the City Clerk, Amanda Barnes. Today's meeting is being conducted electronically and is allowed as described by Mayor Dyer during his reading of the call for special session. Also, please note this meeting is being recorded. To ensure this live electronic event is successful, please note the following meeting instructions must be followed. There is one presentation listed on the agenda. At the end of the presentation, the mayor will open the floor for questions. It is important that council members hold their comments until recognized. It is helpful for council members to ask all questions and end by stating that you will stand by for answers. This helps to ensure all questions are answered before I move to the next council member. During council discussion, again, it is important that council members hold their comments until recognized. The city clerk will recognize the council members in the order in which they raise their virtual hand. It is important that each council member lower their virtual hand at the conclusion of their comments and re-raise to make any additional comments. 
Next, the mayor will open the city open the city council reconciliation. Vice Mayor Wood will read the proposed reconciliation letter dated May 5th. The mayor will then open the floor for discussion and then follow the same format for council discussion as previously described. At the conclusion of the city council reconciliation discussion, the mayor will then move to the ordinance listed on the published agenda. The mayor will ask for a motion and a second and then open the floor for discussion amongst city council members. The city clerk will then recognize the council members in order in the order which they raise their virtual hand. Once discussion is over and the vote is called, the city clerk will proceed with a roll call vote of the city council members. The vote will be by roll call and recorded in the minutes. Mayor and members of council, are there any questions about this process? Seeing no one raise their virtual hand, Mayor, I'll turn the meeting over to you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Leahy. Uh, we have a uh, COVID-19 update. Yeah, uh, yes, Mayor. Or um, Mr. Uh, manager, yeah. So, Mayor and uh, members of council, as we've been doing since the beginning of the um, COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic, uh, we are opening our meeting with uh, Dr. Demetria Lindsay, who is the director of the Virginia Beach Department of Health, and Aaron Sutton, the director of the uh, Virginia Beach Office of Emergency Management, and they will give a uh, brief update about uh, how we're doing. Okay, thank you. Dr. Lindsay. Dr. Lindsay. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Just proceed with your comments. We can hear you fine. All right. Good. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of City Council. We there are 445 Virginia Beach cases officially reported in the VDH website. We are investigating 447 cases, 426 confirmed, and 21 probable cases. Our cumulative death total is 15. Uh, we had no additional cases from yesterday. Um, and the cumulative number of cases released from isolation is 240. Uh, as previously mentioned, the governor has released the Forward Virginia Plan in preparation for easing public health restrictions. The plan focuses on increased testing and contact tracing. Uh, personal protective equipment, and hospital capacity and staffing. Criteria for easing restrictions would include a downward trend in the percentage of positive tests over 14 days, a downward trend in hospitalizations over 14 days, and enough hospital beds and intensive care capacity, as well as increasing and sustainable supply of personal protective Regarding the public health containment strategies, uh, testing would focus on increasing testing to at least 10,000 individuals per day. And there are currently uh, work groups um, involving um, uh, VDH staff as well as uh, members of the community and private sector under uh, the governor uh, actively working on, on these issues. Um, in regard to testing, uh, more testing does consume personal protective equipment, which is why PPE must be available. Uh, there are efforts locally to increase community testing. Also, there's a uh, priority for testing in congregate settings and workplace facilities uh, due to the risk in these areas, uh, as well as uh, a focus on ensuring and encouraging uh, testing among the private sector for, uh, in private physicians' offices. Contact tracing um, is another area of focus, and VDH has uh, implemented or initiated an effort to augment staffing capacity for case investigation and contact tracing statewide. The details of the uh, allocation for Virginia Beach and other districts uh, will be determined later. However, um, 
there is a a minimum interest in having at least 10 regional supervisors, uh, testing coordinators, 200 case investigators, uh, data management staff, and uh, analytics staffs, as well as at least 1,000 contact tracers. Uh, VDH is also implementing applications to manage contact tracing. Isolation and quarantine monitoring will also be a part of, of this focus. Locally, um, the Virginia Beach Health Department uh, has significantly increased activity uh, and support with the Medical Reserve Corps uh, to not only support local efforts, but also as a part of a regional effort uh, that will pull from a pool of skill uh, staff assets to address specific uh, needs such as contact tracing, um, but also to support staffing in long-term care facilities where staffing may have been stressed due to outbreaks. Uh, we have currently initiated that uh, in some local efforts as the need arises. Uh, we are outlining skills and assets to provide to a variety of sources uh, for which we are recruiting staff to help support our uh, efforts, uh, which includes the city as well as uh, school division school nurses. We will begin intensive training shortly on recruited staff, which includes uh, online training through an ASTO, or Association of State and Territorial Health Officers uh, program sponsored by them. Uh, this will involve self-learning, and also we will be providing focus, case observations, and skill assets under trainers on uh, a smaller group or one of our regional pool of MRC will focus on augmenting long-term care staff, as mentioned, medical and non-medical, on our contact tracing and outbreaks, and also on isolation and quarantine monitoring. So these efforts are ongoing. Um, our immediate concern is ensuring that testing is available in communities, particularly those areas where there may be uh, uh, challenges in accessing community in centralized locations, and also uh, focusing on uh, outbreaks that may occur in congregate settings. That's all I have for today, unless there are questions. Okay, any questions for Dr. Lindsay from the council? Mayor, I do not see anyone raising their virtual hand. Okay, Ms. Leahy. Uh, Aaron Sutton, our uh, Director of uh, Emergency Management, will now update you on our city activities. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Council, uh, just a brief update for you. Um, <clears throat> as you're all very well aware of, uh, Go Governor Northam announced yesterday that he will extend key provisions of Executive 53. Uh, which do place restrictions on businesses and gatherings of more than 10 people at least through May 14th at midnight. Um, in the meantime, the Northam administration will continue to monitor the health data, as Dr. Lindsay referenced, uh, the 14 days, um, <clears throat> to see the downward trends uh, in ensuring that we have the PPE, PPE supplies. Um, he did outline a three-phase plan to ease restrictions. Uh, phase one, easing restrictions would continue social distancing, teleworking, recommendations of face coverings, and uh, keeping the 10 people uh, limit. It would ease some limits on business and faith communities and would transition the stay-at-home directive to a safer-at-home guideline, uh, especially for those in vulnerable populations. And we are expecting more specific guidance in the, next, in the coming days. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> on April 28th, President uh, Trump signed an executive order to keep meat processing plants open um, that uses the Defense uh, Protection Act. Um, and Go Governor Northam did acknowledge the outbreaks in meat processing plants on the eastern shore and in the Shenandoah Valley that they're monitoring very closely. <clears throat> Logistics is still, uh, still remains a vital function in our response operations. We are continually assessing PPE needs and submitting orders through private vendors and uh, up through the state to account for short-term and long-term needs. 
Uh, logistics is getting better information on de departmental burn rates, which is informing the process. And procurement has been, ha continues to provide a huge support in helping us purchase the resources needed to comply with the state and federal procurement laws. Um, the state has received approval from FEMA to install and use a decon system uh, in three locations across the Commonwealth that would, be, that would be provided free of charge for states and localities to allow decontamination of our masks. Um, it's a, an, a, a great option, a back, backup option for us uh, as we continue to receive orders of our N95s, um, but we know that that can change uh, very quickly. Um, the EOC is maintaining its current response structure and incorporating recovery and reintegration planning. Last week, uh, I, I sent out a survey to department directors, constitutional offices, and appointed officials to collect information on the city's reopening needs and priorities. We received a tremendous amount of information and are in the process of re reviewing and assessing the data to develop a strategic roadmap for leadership to review. We'll be presenting that on Thursday to the MLT. Some important issues in, in considering this is assessing continued telework options, child care and supporting policies as schools and camps remain closed, PPE provision in general employee safety to maintain social distancing, and how to support public area reopenings and provide support to our businesses. Some of the priorities include supporting um, the upcoming election in June, how to reopen beaches in a safe manner, and how to support our uh, businesses as they reopen. Our special events work group is developing a risk matrix that addresses venue-specific risk and event-specific risk and provides an event forecast tool that interprets the reopening guidance for the large gatherings. They will be integrating Northam's new guidance to update the tool as the situation evolves. Our Department of Human Services continues to process the SNAP applications, and since, as of today, since March 23rd, they have processed 4,380 SNAP benefit applications. Uh, they do an outstanding job in moving it through as quickly as possible. There are currently 92 children registered in the child care services provided by Parks and Rec uh, with support from the schools and are now providing <clears throat> and are now being provided uh, to accommodate shift personnel, including the fire department. Virginia Beach Schools does continue their food distribution uh, to average about 90,000 meals uh, each week. Uh, beginning Monday, May 11th, schools will be expanding its meals from two a day to three a day at 24 of the 36 distri distribution sites. These sites were selected as they serve over 50% of free and reduced lunches. The city and schools are also coordinating with World Central Kitchen to provide feeding for those vulnerable populations that are not served by the USDA school-aged food distribution program. The Eviction Prevention Assistance Program, as you're aware, had a huge influx of applications and has since stopped receiving applications as of noon today uh, so that they can process them. Public safety call volumes saw another uptake this past week with the nice weather but the volumes are still lower than average. And finally, this is Hurricane Preparedness Week. I wanted to let you know that the state has convened their work group with FEMA to develop hurricane contingency plans, and the city is also convening their work group to address mass care sheltering adaptations in this current COVID-19 environment. So please, I leave you with make a plan, get a kit, and stay informed and think about hurricane preparedness as well with this. Is there any questions? Oh, thank you. Any questions from council members? Council, are there any questions? I don't see anyone raising their virtual hand, Mayor. OK, thank, thank you, Aaron. You. Uh, most appreciated. And thank you again for your diligent work. OK, uh, we're going to move forward now with a discussion on moving forward with delayed planning agenda items and possible additional form uh, formal meeting dates. Um, as you know, I call for a special session on this Thursday, you know, coming up. And one of the ideas is that I understand through a number of council members, let's face it, you know, this uh, uh, virtual meetings, you know, is inconvenient. It's not the most effective. It's not the most efficient. But as we talk about the backlog and get back to conducting the people's business as in a better way, uh, you know, we're going to have 
a meeting where people, uh, the council will reconvene. At this point, I'm going to ask the city attorney to discuss, you know, the, you know, some of the, it, you know, um, s situations and, you know, wh wh how we're planning to do this in, a, in an effective way. <clears throat> yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, based upon the discussion uh, that the council had last week, and, and as the, you just indicated, Mayor, the desire was for the council, or at least a, a quorum of the council, to reconvene physically. Um, on March 31 of this year, the council passed a policy for remote participation by council members in council meetings. That policy is patterned after uh, Virginia Code Section 2.23708.2, which allows remote participation by council members, provided that there is a policy and provided that a couple of um, prerequisites are met. One, the meeting has to be recorded. Two, a, a quorum of uh, council members must physically be present. And three, any council member who is not going to be physically present uh, needs to notify uh, the chair, in this case you, Mr. Mayor, uh, on, or, uh, on the day of the meeting or preferably sometime before. So uh, on Thursday, uh, provided that there are six council members physically present, uh, other council members may participate remotely if, uh, for one of the reasons set forth in the policy, uh, they uh, either have a medical need or a personal reason to participate remotely. If less than six people are physically present, then the policy doesn't apply and the, and the requirements of the statute would not be met, and there could be no remote participation uh, so that the, um, the persons who are physically present could remain and talk, but there would not be a, a quorum and, 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 and remote participation would not be allowed. Finally, because uh, the FOIA law says that any time three or more council members are present and discussing council business, uh, the public uh, must be uh, allowed to attend. So uh, staff has made arrangements for there to be some limited seating in the chamber, uh, uh, but the number of people who can, can come in will be limited in order to provide appropriate social distancing in accordance with the guidelines recommended by the CDC and the Department of Health. And by doing this at a workshop format on Thursday, hopefully we'll be able to debug, you know, some of the problems that may arise and also to, you know, uh, give counsel, you know, a sense of confidence that we're doing things in, in a very safe and productive way. And, uh, you know, obviously, um, you know, we do have a backlog that we have to, con uh, to consider. Mr. Leahy, can you give a description of the backlog we're now currently confronting? Yes, Mayor. Um, there are uh, 95 items backlogged uh, for City Council. 18 are public hearings, ordinances, or resolutions. These were uh, uh, mostly either scheduled for uh, March 17th uh, or deferred to March 17th, and they've all, they were all, um, uh, they were all uh, suspended when the uh, meetings were suspended. There are also 77 planning items, of which 58 are um, uh, short-term rentals. So it's 18 uh, ordinances, resolutions, or hearings, 77 planning items, and 58, uh, 58 of which of those 77 are short-term rentals. In May and June, there are 73 planning items uh, scheduled for the Planning Commission, of which 51 are short-term rentals. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, just to facilitate the discussion, you know, some of the things that we have, you know, talked about. Uh, you know, first of all, instead of having workshops every other week, that we have formal meetings every week to catch up. Uh, um, the other thing is, uh, you know, that we suspend our, uh, you know, summer vacation. And then also was a recommendation that if necessary, we have, you know, two meetings a week until we get caught up. But once again, at this point, this is the council discussion. And Madam Clerk, if we can open it up for co council comment at this point. The first council member with a comment or question is uh, uh, 
Council Member John Moss, and then the next one will be Council Member, I mean, Vice Mayor Jim Wood. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I, I do think we have to meet more, more frequently. I think that's true. Um, I think there are a couple items that are on that planning agenda, which ha are of high visibility. Uh, one is, I think all of us know is Westminster Canterbury is one of those issues, which you've all heard extensively from the public. And the other one is the Thalia Wayside, which is a substantial amount of the public want to be heard. Um, I don't know that for those two items that uh, even though we may only have six, we might want to look at using the juvenile court, old court building space where we have convened with the council and the school board together to uh, allow those people to participate or to work some kind of a system where maybe people remain in their cars and allowed to come and speak. As I know on those two issues, I, like you, I'm sure have heard from a lot of folks and they want to uh, physically appear. And I, have, I think since body language is 85% of communication, and that's a scientific fact, not just an opinion, I think people want to personally be, be heard and personally be seen as to their view. And I think they want to be able to see us when they're talking uh, as a body. So I, I think we, in general, I think we can work some of these items like, you know, daycare and all the, the probably the short-term rental issues, but there are some planning items I do believe we need to examine and look at and say, where this format of just six people and just a few people being able to be present or speak uh, without being on the electronic means may not uh, rise to the expectations of the people we work for. Uh, if I can say, uh, we we are willing to accommodate everybody, correct? You know, if they can make it, you know, we have the seating capacity. Yeah, Mayor, if I might. Yes, Mr. Leahy. Uh, so, Mayor and members of council, um, anticipating that this day would come, staff have been uh, looking at alternative uh, uh, arrangements for how we could set up a, a, a meeting that would physically uh, have council present. And uh, we did look at uh, uh, what we call Building 19, which is the uh, large meeting room that uh, uh, when you have met with the school board. As it turns out, um, even though it can be deceptive, probably because of the lower ceilings and darker um, uh, environment here in the council chambers, the council chambers are not uh, significantly different in size from Building 19. One of the rooms is a little longer and the other is a little wider, but in terms of square footage, uh, they're almost uh, identical. We have, um, in fact, set up uh, and, ha and can set up an arrangement where all 11 council members uh, can be seated uh, with uh, approximately six, foot, six feet of separation. Uh, if you've seen what's uh, being broadcast when the mayor speaks, you can see uh, seven of the chairs uh, set up right now and then we can have uh, uh, tables uh, put out in the main part of the council chamber and we have set it up and uh, we think it'll work. The ability to control sound, audio, cameras, transmission, uh, broadcast to Cox uh, cable is uh, infinitely superior in the council chambers and so um, uh, we believe we can set up a meeting with all 11 council members uh, separated uh, with uh, just the staff that are necessary and accommodate uh, uh, a limited number of uh, individuals. Then we can also, in the long hallway between council chambers um, and uh, uh, the other end of the building, we can separate chairs for uh, people who would be able to sit in those chairs. And then if they were signed up to speak, we could call their names and bring them in to speak. So we do have a plan. We think we can pull it off. Okay, thank you, sir. Vice Mayor Wood, and after Vice Mayor Wood would be Council Member Tower. Um, thank you. I agree with um, what Mr. Moss said on, on a number of things there. I, I had an opportunity yesterday to take a look at the, um, the layout that the staff has for the, um, the social distancing for the council and the chambers. And, and I, it works. I, I think it'll work. The, the problem is, is there, there's not a whole lot of space, as Mr. Moss said, for for the public. I, I share his concern uh, for the ability of the public to to be there because we do have several 
controversial items. Plus, we have, you know, with each one of these short term rentals, if 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 we've got you know seventy some of those and or fifty some of, of those, and we have two people or three people coming for each one, just representing the applicant, that that'll quickly overwhelm uh, the ability that we have. And, but in the same respect, moving to another venue might not be so good because it's it's a lot more difficult to broadcast it. So, so the devil's in the details. I, I worry about the logistics of getting the public in, and and frankly, the logistics involving the uh, the city staff who have been um, isolated from the public for for this amount of time. We have to make sure that we 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 maintain that separation as well. So, so th those are just a couple things that I that I have a concern about. Councilmember Guy Tower. Mr. Leahy essentially answered my questions. Thank you. I was, uh, I'm still not quite sure I understand how the council itself will be uh, set up for the meeting. I'll start with that question though, if he could be a little more specific about that. Uh, yes, Councilman Tower. So. Um, if you uh, can see the layout from uh, from Mark, from Mark, the mayor, and myself, there's actually room for there's Tom, seven. Sorry, can you start your remarks again? You weren't on yet. Okay. Um, if you look at the sorry, council sorry. Diaz and including um, Mark Stiles' seat and my seat, there is uh, seating for seven council persons, each with approximately six foot of separation. Uh, we have four tables that we would place down. Uh, in the uh, big open area in the council chambers here, and that could accommodate four other uh, city council members. Uh, the city attorney, myself, and the clerk would work uh, behind the counter that uh, the, where the planning staff normally um, uh, would occupy. And then we would set something up over by the um, uh, first row of, uh, of seats for other city staff. Mr. Tower, and um, as a follow up, how many how many people do you think can be accommodated in the council chambers, and is there any planning for overflow on any item so that if there were more more people who wanted to speak, then could be safely accommodated at one time in chambers? Would there is there any way to keep that? safely keep folks uh, in a holding area somewhere where they're also distanced? If we can uh, accommodate about 25 uh, residents inside the council chambers and they would uh, average about six feet separation. Uh, they'd be spread out among the uh, seats. And then we would put a uh, line, the hallway between the council chambers and the north end of the building uh, with seats properly separated uh, for uh, overflow speakers. Uh, but if, a, if somebody was just coming to attend and watch the meeting, they would be much, they'd be very advised uh, and wiser to stay home and watch it from there. Uh, we would encourage only those who wish to speak to show up because if um, uh, we would have trouble, perhaps, if say 150 people showed up and uh, but only say 25 wanted to speak. We would have trouble accommodating 150 people. Mr. Tower. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any further questions at this time. Council member Jessica Abbott. Hi, yeah, I have, um, Tom, I'm wondering about alternative venues. I'm <laughs> I'm mostly concerned with the uh, with the potential for the for the the bigger items that we might see. We I think we would normally see well over 25 people on some of our more controversial items. So, have we? Is the convention center not available? Could we not make that work? I know that um, we've done broadcasts out of that building, um, and I I don't I doubt it's booked at this moment. Um, all things considered. Um, or is there maybe one of the high schools, most of the high schools have a uh, pretty state-of-the-art auditor auditorium. So I wonder if there might be bigger space 
um, for us on the stage and then maybe a uh, greater capacity for individuals in, in the auditoriums at some of the high schools. So I'm just curious if those options were evaluated. We have uh, looked at the convention center and we can uh, use the convention center. Uh, we were work approaching the council chambers from a, the concept of fairly regular meetings that begins to present some issue at the convention center uh, with the uh, staff's need to set up cameras and uh, ability to broadcast to 48 uh, on short notice. There's a lot of work to set that up. And so to set that up uh, and tear it down uh, frequently uh, presents a little bit of an issue. Um, we would have to ask the schools if they would be willing to open some of the schools uh, for their facilities. Uh, I'm not sure how that uh, would be received. Councilmember Abbott, did you have additional questions or comments? I didn't, I didn't hear the first half of Tom's response, so I don't know if I'm the only one who didn't hear it. Council, um, City Manager, if you would just wait until you actually see your picture come up, uh, then they'll have the audio. Okay, I'm sorry that you weren't able to hear me. Uh, with respect to alternative locations, we did uh, consider the uh, convention center. The can, uh, when we recommend the city council chambers, we were looking at that from a standpoint of having one, maybe even two meetings per week uh, and the uh, vastly improved um, ability for audio and video transmission, particularly the transmission to for live broadcast uh, to Cox 48. Uh, we can use the convention center. There is a significant overhead in setting up uh, the cameras and their staff to operate the cameras uh, in, and to bring in uh, some form of satellite truck in order to live broadcast to channel 48 to Cox 48. Um, so for a one single meeting uh, that we anticipated a lot of people to show up, that might be an option for one or two meetings per week. There is a tremendous amount of uh, overhead in setting up uh, for live broadcast to Cox 48. And one more thing, uh, also, we really, until until we have a lot more time behind us, we really should encourage those people who want to just observe the meeting to watch remotely, and those people who feel the need to participate in the meeting by speaking would be the ones that we should try to accommodate. Typically, uh, the number of people who speak are far less than the number of people who wish to observe the um, agenda item. Could I ask a question? Uh, Mr. Leahy, was the ATC ever considered? The ATC was uh, looked at a little bit. It didn't have, in trying to set up uh, council, um, uh, set it up in a way so the council could uh, uh, be assembled on the stage with proper distancing. The stage okay. is just simply not large enough for that. Okay, thank you. A anybody else, uh, Madam Clark? Yes. Um, Councilman Rabbit, did you have any additional questions or comments? Yeah, I well, I had one other comment on the location. I think we should um, we should look at the schools. I I I'm sure some of them have large enough auditoriums and stages to accommodate us. Uh, I mean, I don't know why they wouldn't want us to do that. And perhaps we can work with the school board to set it up so that um, whatever we set up can stay stay there for the duration of the emergency, and school board can use it, and we can use it, and um, kind of set it up so that we've, we've got some collaboration there. But if that's not an option, I understand. Um, I also have wanted to just make a comment about uh, participation. Would it be possible to kind of do a mix of what we're doing now where um, we have, where we're physically meeting and there's some seating available for people who want to participate in person, but then there are the ability for people to call in remarks the way they do um, via WebEx when we have these virtual meetings, because I do think there will be some people that are really reluctant to come out and speak, but they won't, um, 
we don't want to discourage their participation when they could easily call in or video call in. So I'm wondering, could we do, I don't know if Mark has to answer that question, but is there a way to kind of have a hybrid where, yeah, we'll have seating for people who want to be here in person, but we can also take speakers um, digitally and he just hear those remarks. Um, that, that's, that was, that's the last question I have. Okay. Mr. Yep, yep. Mr. Leahy, would you like to respond? Well, uh, I'm not sure if you heard the pri my uh, uh, what I said about the schools. We certainly would could open dialogue with the schools. The schools right now are closed, and I can't really uh, predict exactly what the school system uh, uh, response might be as far as uh, opening up a school that would uh, uh, for council meetings. Uh, but we can ask that question. I think Mark would have to ask answer the question with respect to um, a hybrid system of um, uh, uh, virtual participation and uh, physical participation. There is uh, nothing legally that prohibits the council from doing that if that's the choice the council makes. Council Member Rosemary Wilson and then Council Member Sabrina Wooten will be after Ms. Wilson. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, I wanted to speak to when we have the meetings. Um, I think twice a week is hard on staff. It's, I know the staff has to do a lot to get prepped for our meetings. Um, I do think that workshop days we to catch up was probably a good idea to go ahead and have a formal meeting the same days that we have a workshop um, and most likely to not have a holiday. I doubt too many people are gonna be traveling anyway. Um, but I also think we should limit our number. We don't have to get through all 58 short term rentals in one night. We need to just limit how many we're gonna hear in a night. And then hopefully that'll also contain how many people will come out and speak. So if we're meeting more often, um, that could also help control how many people come to the meeting. So that's just my two cents worth. Thank you. Council member Sabrina Wooten and after Ms. Wooten will be Vice Mayor Wood. Uh, I wanted to, um, I guess, kind of follow up with and, and I guess we will be, I'm not sure at this point, but will we still be, uh, when we do meet, will we still be recognizing the guidelines for 10 people? As I know, um, you know, with depending on how many people are out and we wanna make sure that we are observing those guidelines and making sure people are safe. Oftentimes we're in a room for many hours at a time and um, also concerned too, if you have, you know, you're in a, in a meeting space, depending on the size, um, just one person has to cough. And that cough and droplets will travel many, many feet, many, many miles. And I want to know, um, are we going to have people wear a mask as they come in? Are we wearing masks? Uh, and then also, how about um, the cleaning uh, after these meetings? Will they be environmentally cleaned, sanitized? So those are my concerns. Mr. Leahy. Uh, so Councilwoman uh, Wooten, um, with respect to the uh, gathering of 10 people or more, Obviously, we would not be able to maintain that limit in the council chambers. Uh, council uh, key staff uh, will probably approach 20, and then there would be a, a approximately 25, um, uh, up to 25 residents uh, in the room, uh, perhaps even uh, a couple of reporters. Uh, we would be able to maintain approximately the, the six-foot um, social distance. Uh, with respect to masks, uh, we would provide uh, masks for staff. We would encourage uh, the residents to wear masks, but we cannot um, mandate that they uh, wear masks. And um, I'm not sure I remember what the third issue was. Sanitation. 
Oh, and sanitation. We already have enhanced sanitation. Yes, the room would be um, wiped down and cleaned down on a uh, frequent basis, which we're actually doing in, in Building 1 right now. Council Member Wooten, did you have additional questions or comments? Uh, I Yes, just real quickly. I would just really, um, I'm really cautious with the number of people in the room. Uh, I, I just want to make sure that whatever plan we go with uh, is the best and the most viable. Um, I, I really do want to, uh, you know, ensure that, you know, we're not in a room with you know, um, for many hours with the potential of coughing and germs flowing. I think we really need to look at whatever layout we have really needs to be safe. Um, and we really need to make sure masks are going to be uh, worn during that time as well. We don't want the potential of, you know, people getting sick and conducting business. So. Councilmember Moss, and then after Mr. Moss will be Councilmember Lewis Jones. I wanted to come back to one of the comments that uh, Councilmember Wilson mentioned, but also uh, back into Councilmember Rouse's uh, letter about you know, you know, meeting more often and talking more often, um, even if it is this format. But getting back to what Mr. Leahy said, because I'm. I'm one thinking that there's a lot of people with those items, and I agree with Ms. Wilson, we don't want to have 29, because uh, we've been there before, uh, short-term rental applications on, on one night after we've had another busy agenda, and there is, uh, there is mental fatigue that happens after you've been sitting there for seven or eight hours, I think, it takes place. But I don't know that if we made a decision, and maybe we wouldn't make that decision, but realizing that a lot of those applications have to do with property owners' ability to generate revenue from their property, which they're current expenses on in some cases, and to have a timely decision, if we took the one-time setup cost for the convention center, and instead of, and since all these products and have been staffed by the planning department. So the, the work is they're ready for our action. We couldn't have a, wouldn't be easy. Everyone wouldn't make every meeting, but we could always have a quorum. Why we just wouldn't meet every day for a week. And, and we would just say, we're just gonna work down the short-term rental issues. And, and say, you know, can we, could we, if we did that over a week, uh, you start at four and end at eight. Uh, reasonable four hours started at three and ended at eight, five hours a day for five. Could we actually uh, serve the people who want to turn their properties into income producing things? Could we could we do that? Uh, it's it's, it's uh, you know trying to be responsive and how could we work differently? Maybe when we do meet, start earlier, have no briefings on and start earlier in the day take a long day, take a time for break, but look at a different time where we meet longer, uh, but with breaks to move some of these uh, packages that, uh, down so these people can get about their their business of uh, earning money because the time is money for them. And I don't know that we couldn't meet more, more frequently or package them differently uh, so that we could uh, operate. And if we did that, then the one-time cost of setup of the pavilion, of the convention center, excuse me, old hat, convention center would be uh, something that might be more platable. I realize people, including myself, work schedules are different, but I think the public would, maybe they wouldn't be, but in terms of as long as we can get a majority of us there, and there's only one or two missing, you know, for whatever reason, but we can move the city's business along and get these people with their projects and their capital and their investment and whatever loans they might have to get them uh, processed a little faster. I do want to know who the city attorney's barber is because my hair looks crazy. <laughs> so his looks really sharp. So he's got the email me, Mark, you know, what your secret is. And if you do it yourself, well, then hats off to you. But I do think we should look for some ways to... Uh, package the work, maybe meet a little more frequently on a sustained basis to move these packages along so that people could proceed with their projects and 
and start making money for them and making money for us. Council Member Jones, and after Mr. Jones is Council Member Mike Berlucci. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, first, let me say that uh, I think we, I agree with John to the extent that uh, we have a, a lot of people who are waiting to get answers as far as their uh, properties and so forth. So these planning items need to be addressed as soon as possible. Uh, my first reaction, uh, having uh, been in the council chamber and seen what the setup is that the uh, city manager had contemplated, I just happened to be there, uh, is that he's he, he's got a plan and it might be worth our while to try at least one meeting and see how it works. Um, I'm, I'm a little questionable about how many people are actually going to come uh, to a, a meeting and, and want to sit close to a, a lot of other people. Uh, uh, I think maybe we may be overestimating how many people might be coming. I do agree with John that uh, the Westminster Canterbury uh, application and the Thalia uh, application might be the two that are going to uh, create the most uh, uh, number of people to show up. But I'd like to try uh, the plan that the city manager has in the council chamber at least once and see how it works. And uh, so we can get moving and, and uh, start taking care of business. Thank you. Council member Michael Berlucci. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to agree with the comments that were expressed by Mr. Jones and Mr. Moss just a few moments ago about the need to get moving. Um, I think that for me, I don't have a strong opinion about the location, so I'll defer to the um, city manager and the team at Virginia Beach because I believe that they um, are capable and aware of the need to be safe and efficient. And so uh, I'm comfortable trusting. Um, they're uh, deferring to their good judgment and management on that question about logistics of where um, and how, but um, I will say that it's incumbent upon us and point out really it's our responsibility to continue to move the and the housing industries are ones that are lesser impacted than many others in um, in uh, in the marketplace in in uh, in our economy. And the risk that we take by continuing to delay these projects is to depress another industry, to have another industry be impacted by our um, failure to act. And so we must act. It's our it's our duty and responsibility. And um, and but not only council. So that's my point. Uh, but my question specifically for Mr. Leahy is about the um, planning commission and the wetlands boards and other uh, boards and commissions that are associated with this discussion. And will they have the opportunity to meet and to continue to um, make sure that people have a right to um, have their projects heard fairly and to um, continue to support an industry that um, vital to our economy and to the uh, health and welfare of people who live in Virginia Beach. Councilman Bellucci, um, we had envisioned that the room would be available for the other boards and commissions, the council chambers would be available for other boards and commissions to use. Again, subject to pretty much the same um, limitations, uh, the number of attendees would have to be limited to keep the 
uh, density and the distancing in the room down. Uh, so council, the, the, the procedures developed for council would become the uh, procedures developed for the other boards and commissions. Councilmember Berlucci, did you have additional questions or comments? Uh, just a comment is to thank the manager for considering that and to emphasize um, important in this um, forward momentum for members for this council, but also for those associated boards and commissions. And so just want to thank everyone for keeping that in mind and for uh, moving forward. Thank you. Uh, this time we can bring forward Bobby Tahan, our planning director, uh, for some clarifications. Um, Mr. Bellucci. Just so that uh, you're aware, also the Planning Commission, the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Area Board, and the Wetlands Board uh, currently have scheduled a virtual meeting uh, for their uh, starting up their items uh, as we get guidance from uh, Council uh, moving forward on how to utilize the chambers. Uh, we will determine if we're able to hold in-person meetings as well uh, with the direction from the City Manager. So, uh, But we do have virtual meetings scheduled for uh, the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Area Board on uh, May 18th, the Planning Commission doing a virtual meeting as well on May 27th, and the Wetlands Board doing a virtual meeting on the 28th. And then starting, uh, moving forward from there, we are scheduled to do virtual meetings, but again, we will be planning on trying to figure that out m moving forward safely. Thank you, Bobby. Appreciate it. Councilmember Aaron Rouse. Good afternoon, colleagues. It's, it's good to see everyone. Um, good to see everyone. How everyone is safe and your families are safe as well. Um, first of all, Amanda, I just want to take my hat off to you and your staff. I think you're doing a, a hell of a job making sure we get all the information um, every week. That's the, the one thing I noticed that hasn't changed throughout this whole pandemic is uh, your level of expertise and professionalism. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> my comments are more so geared towards our, our capacity and workload. Um, you know, we always like to tout we're the largest populated city in Virginia. Well, it's time we, we start acting like it and, and getting more down to work. Now, all of you have expressed more um, incredible concerns about making sure um, that the public is safe and making sure we are safe um, from each other as well. So I'm really, I don't really have a, a concern about the location. I think. Mr. Leahy's, um, you know, uh, solution to meeting in council chambers is probably one that will suffice. I think um, Councilwoman Abbott's um, um, thought, the idea about using the schools is is probably a good one as well. Um, and I think Councilmember Moss is about using the convention center is 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 a good one too. But one thing I think the consistent denominator is our workload. In our in our work capacity, I I think we should be meeting if if not every day as much as possible to to get down to workload. We have a nine month backlog, um, and I think it's becoming upon us to start getting to work. I understand, um, you know, the, the road ahead is long, the road ahead is hard, and we don't have all the answers right now. Um, but I think we continuously have to work um, the issue each and every day. Um, like we're doing, but more so as a as a group, as a as a combined group with a combined effort um, and focus. When it comes down to short term rentals, there are a lot. Um, Councilwoman uh, Wilson, maybe we can limit a, a day how many we do, but you know I, I think is I think we should just hunker down and get through as much as we can in and any and every day um, to to get ahead and and keep our city uh, functioning. Um, so. I'm open to all the ideas and and, and other um, thoughts on how we can continuously meet, whether that's in person or whether that's virtually. But I think it's important for us to start getting our city to function again um, um, because of a number of other important issues, whether that's is looking for a city manager uh, or continuing the process of hiring a police chief or making sure um, you know, we're doing what's things that are necessary to keep Virginia Beach not only afloat, but uh, progressive and moving forward um, 
at the end of these emergency response from our governor. So, thank you. Council member Jessica Abbott. I had a, que a scheduling question for our backlog of agenda items. Is it possible for us to um, take all the items that we know we have pending and prioritize them by, you know, what we think will be like the least controversial versus what's going to be the most controversial and that way we can set up our calendar in a way that's efficient. So we're going to bring down, work the backlog of the things that are the easiest to work first and then, or I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be in that order, but is there a way for us to re kind of retool our agenda so that we're not necessarily just going in order of how, when we were going to hear them, but maybe just to find a more efficient way to work the ones that aren't going to require as much. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of ways. More, my I guess my question is: Is there a way to kind of optimize the agendas so that we we're we're working smarter? Mr. Mr. Styles, um, I don't know that there's a law that prohibits you from trying to separate them out by what you think is controversial or not. I would say that that's difficult to do with any level of precision or reliability and what I would think would be more defensible uh, in the event of a challenge would be if you broke them down by type. For example, if you separated out short-term rentals from the other planning items and said, you know, on, on these days of the, if we're meeting twice a week, on these days of the week we're going to do uh, planning items that are not associated with short-term rentals and on these days we're going to do short-term rentals. I would think that would be uh, th that would prevent any citizen from feeling like uh, they got picked uh, or 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 omitted from an agenda uh, when they shouldn't have been. Councilmember Abbott, did you have any other questions or comments? No, not really. I I didn't, I didn't mean it to sound like we were going to do just you know we were going to try to be the judge on that. I just want to think, I want to, I want to figure out a way that we can be efficient so that we're not, um, I can recall a couple council meetings where we just put way too much on the agenda that were, that was really high profile items and we ended up filling up chambers and then we didn't have room for people. So I just want to, I want to avoid that situation again. So that we, if we know we're going to be seeing a lot of people on an, on a um, on a specific item, that we're not filling it with other things that might also have a lot of uh, uh, a lot of attention as well. So um, I, I kind of like the idea of grouping them by category. I think in, in any way that we can work more efficiently is is what I'm interested in. But no other questions. Are there any other council members that have questions or comments? Mayor, I, I don't see anyone raising their virtual hand. I'll turn the meeting it, up to you. You know, that was a great discussion and a lot of food for thought. Yes, the journey starts with the first step, and I think by us convening together on Thursday in a workshop format, you know, we can work out some of the details and have a discussion among each other on how to proceed going forward. I think going forward, based on the discussion we just had, we have to be nimble and flexible and adaptable, you know, to the situations as they arise. But I think that might be a lot easier once we are actually physically convening among ourselves, and then, uh, you know, we can get the right direction. So once again, thank you for that. Okay, moving on now, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Vice Mayor Wood to read the uh, updated version of the reconciliation letter into the record, and then we will open the floor for discussion. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I echo um, Mr. Moss's comments about Mr. Stiles' haircut. It does, it does look pretty good. Um, mine was actually done by my wife after she watched some YouTube videos, and it, it's pretty good, too. Everybody should have a copy of this document. Uh, it was emailed to you uh, this morning. There are a few changes to it. My apologies in advance for reading through it. Um, it's dated May 5th, 2020 today, addressed to members of city council, subject FY 2021 operating budget and CIP reconciliation. Dear city council members, on March 24th, 2020, 
The acting city manager presented his original proposed FY 2021 operating budget and capital improvement program. Due to the economic impacts of COVID-19 on our city, the city manager provided a revised FY 2021 operating budget and CIP on April 10th, 2020. The revised budget outlined reductions associated with decreases in tax revenue as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and return services to an FY1920 levels. These reductions are highlighted in green on attachment A. Last Thursday, we provided a proposal for reconciliation of the proposed budget and CIP. We believe this revised letter incorporates some of the concerns addressed at Thursday's budget workshop and includes tax relief for businesses and citizens as well as an additional strategy to meet revenue shortfalls in FY 2021. If revenue is not meeting estimates, as discussed on Thursday, two tax and fee relief programs have already been addressed in the letter below. See items four, personal property tax relief for volunteer emergency medical services and volunteer fire personnel, and item 11, assistance to the monthly city services bill. At the same time we vote for the budget and CIP next week, we recommend that City Council consider a $3 million tax relief plan to take effect within the current fiscal year of FY19 and 20, 2 million for providing both real estate and personal property tax relief for citizens in need, and 1 million to provide additional business tax relief to the Small Business Emergency Assistance Program implemented by the Virginia Beach Development Authority. Supporting these tax relief initiatives will be the appropriation of fund balance from the Parks and Recreation Special Revenue Fund. As we begin the new fiscal year with economic uncertainty, it is critical that the city manager and staff provide financial updates on revenues and expenditures. The revised FY 2021 operating budget has created a great deal of flexibility. However, it's possible that additional city council action would be required should revenues decline below current estimates. To provide extra flexibility and preserve the city's cash position during these uncertain times, it is recommended that appropriations within the following capital improvement projects be placed in reserve entitled COVID-19 Revenue Shortfall Stabilization. This reserves totals $21.8 million and can be only utilized after City Council approval. If FY 2021 revenue is meeting estimates after quarterly reviews, funding can be returned to the City projects listed below with City Council approval. If revenue is not meeting estimates, the reserve can be used to offset revenue shortfalls. The following is a list of projects totaling 21.8 million. CIP 8-025, Beach Replenishment 2, which is $2,550,000. CIP 3-718, Police Radio Encryption, which is $3,302,428. CIP 2-094, Bus Stop Infrastructure and Accessibility Improvements, $648,969, CIP 2-414, Ships Corner Road Improvements, $2,100,000, CIP 2-047, Upton Drive Extended and Dam Next Stations Improvements, and that's $1,286,780, CIP 3-153, Various Site Acquisitions 3, which is $343,644, CIP 3-132, Heritage Building Maintenance 2, $575,000. CIP 4-300, Community Recreation Centers Repairs and Renovations 3, which is $1 million. CIP 4-301, Parks and Special Use Facilities Development Renovation, $950,000. CIP 3-703, Police Department Special Investigation v Video Storage, $400,000. CIP 2-056, Pleasure House Road Street Improvements, Phase 1, $150,000. CIP 2-057, Pleasure House Road Street Improvements, Phase 2, $357,376. CIP 9-006, Winston-Salem Avenue Improvements, $7,565,191. CIP 3-184, Virginia Aquarium Monument signs $600,000. When combined with the total anticipated salary vacancy savings from the position freeze, which we recommended continuing into FY 2021 and fully funding full-time salaries not budgeting for attrition, a minimum of $10 million of vacancy savings compared to previous years should be available to offset potential revenue shortfalls. Between these two initiatives, 
Over $30 million should be available to offset revenue shortfalls if the economy does not improve. Please note, we also recommend in placing CIP 3-174 operations facilities renovation $30 million in a reserve until City Council approves a release of funds. This project is anticipated to be funded by bonds and the resulting debt service will impact the budget beyond FY 2021. While this project Renovations of buildings 1, 2, and 11 is important in the aftermath of the May 31st tragedy. We believe the city should not initially expend these funds to ensure that our cash flow is sufficient pending improvement of the. To recommend that the city manager continue limiting expenditures to essential services only as we begin the new fiscal year. As noted on page 22 of the April 10th letter, the city manager's revised budget provided a balancing strategy for most funds. However, additional analysis required to determine the best strategy for balancing both the Tourism Investment Program TIP and the Tourism Advertising Program TAP funds. These funds are projected to have their original FY 2021 revenue estimates reduced by a combined $16 million. Balancing these funds through expenditure reductions alone would result in an almost complete elimination of current services provided through the TIP funds, programs such as beach management, beach maintenance, trash collections, beach events, et cetera, and a reduction of 25% in TAP fund advertising and marketing efforts. As the economy begins to reopen, TIP and TAP programs and services will be essential to the recovery of the local tourism industry. For that reason, it is recommended that the primary balancing strategy of the TIP and TAP funds include the use of $14.8 million of fund balance from the TIP fund. Of this use, $9.8 million will be appropriated within the TIP fund and 5 million will be transferred to the TAP fund. Additional, rev additional funding within the TAP fund will allow the city to not only maintain current services, but also enhance marketing and advertising efforts across the city. The enhanced marketing and advertising campaign plan will occur in two phases. The first phase includes an additional $2 million between now and July 1st with the city council action anticipated in May. The second phase will include an additional 1.6 million dollars appropriated on July 1st as part of the FY 2021 operating budget. The projected fund balance of the TIP fund at the year end of FY 2021 is $1.7 million or 4% of the following year's revenue estimate. This results in an overall increase to the net budget changes reflected in the April 10th presentation. These recommendations are highlighted in blue on attachment A. Also noted within the letter on page 22 in presentations uh, additional refinements were needed as a result of departmental specific revenue reductions. These reductions resulted in the additional elimination of nearly 24 FTEs and are highlighted orange on attachment A. In total, the city manager's revised FY 2021 operating budget includes a net reduction of 58.02 FTEs when compared to the FY 2019-2020 budget. The modification of the FY 2020-2021 revenue estimates results in the reduction of 20.4 million in local revenue shared with the schools. On page 22 of the April 10th letter, as a part of the process moving forward, it was noted that city staff was continuing to work with school staff to modify the school's FY 2021 operating budget accordingly. On April 28th, the school board reduced approximately $28 million in their FY 2021 operating budget. In order to incorporate the budget amendments adopted by the Virginia Beach School Board, the following adjustments are necessary. One, reduce the transfer from the city's general fund by $20,372,434 and reduce estimated revenue from the Commonwealth by $6,926,614. These reductions in revenue were offset with the elimination of the following appropriations. A, $19,532,825 originally approved for a 0.5% experience step increase and a 3.0% cost of living adjustment. B, elimination of 69.55 FTEs and $4,492,077 in related salaries and operating supplies. C, $2,774,146 and other operating costs within the school operating fund. D, $500,000 transfer to the school's capital improvement program. Number two, Reduce school CIP project 1-107 Princess Anne High School replacement by $26.5 million over the six year CIP period. This results in corresponding reduction in the school CIP means of pay as you go financing in year one by 500,000, year two by 1 million, 
and by 1.5 million each of the remaining years three through six. Also reduced to the school's use of fund balance from the school reserve revenue fund in the CIP by 3.6 million in year two, 3.7 million in year three, 3.8 million in year four, 3.9 million in year five, and $4 million in year six. The city manager's revised FY 2021 operating budget retains several proposals that should help in hiring and retaining our valued workforce, including <clears throat> increase the hybrid employee paid time off, accrual of an additional 15 days per year, and expanding the maximum allowable carryover by six days. Uh, also expansion of the city's maternity paternity leave program from three weeks to six weeks. After listening to public input at the public hearings and via email, as well as discussions with city council members, it's recommended that city managers FY 2021 operating budget and CIP <clears throat> as reflected on attachment A be adopted with the following adjustments. One, reinstatement of the original proposed initiatives to implement recommendations of the 2018 disparity study. This increases the Department of Finance's budget by $366,541, including one additional position. Excuse me. Two, reinstatement of the following compensation initiatives previously provided by the City Council. Year two, public safety workforce development. Year two, phase in of moving supervisors to their pay range midpoint. Through these initiatives, the city will continue to address critical compensation needs and continuing to build off previous efforts to address compression across the city. A compensation reserve of $1,188,714 in the general fund is established to address these initiatives. Three, elimination of the 2% planned increase in employee health insurance premium rates scheduled to take place on January 1, 2021. City employee premium rates will remain at the same level as 2020 health insurance premium rates. The city, the schools also eliminated their 2% planned increase. Since both the city and schools will be eliminating pay increases, we believe this will help reduce the financial impact to city and school employees with no pay increases planned for FY 2021. The total impact to the health insurance fund is approximately $630,000. The 3% employer increase remains in both the schools and city budget. Four, provide personal property tax relief for volunteer firefighters and volunteer emergency medical services personnel. To provide this tax relief, qualifying personal property will be taxed at a lowered rate of one millionth of one cent on each $100 of assessed valuation. This reduction reduction will result in the projected loss of $60,000 in personal property tax revenue. Reinstatement of the originally proposed funding increases of $7,000 to the Atlantic Wildfowl Heritage Museum and $15,000 to the Virginia Beach Surf and Rescue Museum. Uh, six, move the 135,000 Museum of Contemporary Arts MOCA education grants from the Department of Cultural Affairs to non-departmental organization grants. This will provide additional transparency in the future budgeting of this grant initiative. Seven, even during these tough economic times, it is critical to address the safety and security of our employees and citizens. We recommend beginning the implementation of the Hillard Hines recommendations, including the centralization of human resources and establishing a security office as follows. A, four human resource positions to begin the phase centralization of human resource functions. This increases the department's operating budget by $397,373. B, one security office position to begin conducting facility security assessment needs. This increases the Office of Emergency Management's operating budget by $64,504. Starting these two initiatives in FY 2021 will allow staff to determine the type and amount of resources necessary to further implement the recommendations. If revenues are performing favorably based on a mid-year review by staff, additional consideration will be given to funding more of these recommendations in FY 2021. Eight, increase funding contribution to the African American Cultural Center by $50,000. Nine, based on updated fuel cost projections, additional savings are likely to occur in the FY 2021 due to lower fuel prices. General fund budgeted fuel costs are reduced by $299,132. 10, increase general fund VDOT roadway maintenance funding by $1,850,000. The FY 2021 Commonwealth of Virginia's budget reflects a 3.7 increase for financial aid for city road maintenance resulting in that estimated increase of funding. Virginia Beach's portion of this revenue source has historically been 13% of the state's budget. 
Estimating this additional revenue to the Department of Public Works creates capacity to redirect other local revenue sources to fund the previously identified general fund initiatives. 11, the Department of Public Utilities is developing a program to assist individuals recently unemployed due to the COVID-19 pandemic with their monthly city services bill, water, sewer, stormwater, and waste management fees. Working with the Department of Human Services and Information Technology, Public Utilities is developing criteria and the appropriate technology platform for participation in the program with an implementation goal of July 1, 2020. The fee relief program totals $4 million and will be in place until funding is exhausted. Once all program details have been finalized, information will be shared with City Council and our citizens prior to implementation. Funding for this one-time pro program consists of $2.4 million from the fund balance of the water and sewer fund and $1.6 million from the fund balance of the general fund. Until a final implementation plan is developed, these appropriations will be placed into a dedicated reserve for future allocation, which could include the transfer of appropriations between funds. Number 12, provide a $2 million to CIP project 4-059 Southern Rivers Watershed Site Acquisition Program in year one of the CIP. This is a new project in the FY 2021 CIP. This project is one of the strategies to reduce the impact of flooding in the southern part of our city. This appropriation will be supported through the use of fund balance from the general fund. <clears throat> Some city council members have requested reestablishment of part or all of the 2.5% pay increases originally included in the city manager's proposed budget. Before implementing compensation increases or other items, we recommend reviewing the FY 2021 revenue estimates in January 21 after the accounting records are finalized for revenue collection through December 31st, 20. At that point, we should have a better understanding of the financial impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on our local economy, as well as any federal state financial support that may be provided. Please note if revenue decreases beyond estimates, additional city council action might be required to adjust the budget accordingly. The details for the funding sources and city council adjustments provided are reflected on attachment B. And uh, we wanna thank the public who participated in public hearings to offer their comments on the FY 2021 operating budget and CIP, as well as staff for their efforts to provide answers to your various questions. If you have any questions, please contact us directly. And that's it, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wood. At this point, we will open up the council uh, you know, uh, conversation. Are there any council members that have questions or additional or comments? If so, raise your virtual hand. Council member John Moss. Thank you, Amanda, Mr. Mayor. I, now, since we've heard one version of reality, I'd like to talk about another version. Um, I provided to all of you, and, I, and I, there are some good things here. Let me just say that. And, uh, this is certainly people realized on the last time we met, there wasn't six votes what was proposed, and this certainly is an attempt to try to spread the distance. But one of the things that's missing is citizens. We talked about protecting our, our employees against financial stress. We talk about the need for you know, maintaining our buildings, but we didn't really, whoever talks about all families are under financial stress. I read in Sunday's paper and the work, I think it's called the work section of the paper on Sunday, that 91% of mortgage holders, surprised me, had uh, reached out for mortgage relief. Um, I heard today that uh, even though stockyard prices for foods are, are falling because there's surplus demand, that when it gets to the middleware part of the process, that actually in the grocery stores, protein prices are up 24 to 25% in that area so we're obviously people looking forward which this budget is supposed to the financial stress on all citizens seniors who got very small cost of living increases and a comparable medicaid insurance increase probably came out net sum about zero i didn't and we talk about these targeted programs but everyone needs relief we didn't pay our businesses and our residents first so I'd like to just share a little bit before I get to my own spreadsheet and talk about some numbers. The city manager, I want to thank you, Mr. Leahy, for sharing with us the inputs. It was not statistically significant. Let me just say that. It was self-selection of only 51 people. But it was kind of interesting, and it does kind of match up with my anecdotal experiences in the neighbor, 
in the neighborhood and out when I'm out at the grocery store, which isn't very often. But this was comments on the city manager's proposed FY21 budget. Those 51 people thought that the grow the local economy parts of the budget should come down 4.6%. The financially sustainable city providing excellent services should come down 4.8%. And let's not be the one that responded to the surveys. Revitalize neighborhoods and plan for the future down 1.7%. Be a competitive first class resort down 5.7%. That's reduction of revenues from the manager's budget. We are an inclusive community, 1%. Be the safest city in Virginia, 0.031%. So very small, three tenths. World class school and instructional program, 1.54%. Data and technology is used to enhance the community, 1.92%. City assets and infrastructure are well maintained. That was the expenditure call category, kind of leading down 1% and capital projects and reserves down 3.23%. So clearly the residents, and that's just 51, but I think it matches up what many of you are hearing, is one, we see, need to see the spending come down and we need uh, tax relief for our businesses. So let's just now turn, if we could, to what the managers, because all this thing didn't change anything with regards to the top line revenues, which were one-tenth of 1% 1 less than the current year. So 2 million, 70, 2 billion, 78 million and some change. I think it's 132. Well, we may believe we're going to collect all those revenues, but if you, if the financial people are right and the hedge fund people are right, and if the congressional budget office is right, it's probably unrealistic that we're going to see those collections of revenues. Uh, for example, real estate revenue, which I talked about last time we met, was, is going to come in as the manager's projection, 605,709,974. I'm reading off another screen, so that's why I'm turning the other way. Well, 3%, if we only collect 97% of that money, which is not an unrealistic, but a conservative, well, that would be $18.2 million that we wouldn't collect. Would be wrong, but that's 18.2. Personal property, a similar thing we had planned to collect. $163 million, roughly $164 million, 3% would be about $5 million we wouldn't collect. Probably utility taxes, since that's a fixed amount, that's probably unchanged. Automobile licenses will probably come down a little bit, maybe if people get rid of cars, that's jump change $116,000. Business license though, however, businesses go out, don't come back. We might lose 10% of our base and the revenues that go with that. That could be $5 million. The restaurant, I said 10. That might be very, uh, might be higher than that, but I just said 10. And that would be $7 million we wouldn't collect during the year. Hotel tax, I said 20%. That would be 7.6 million. Amusement tax, 10% would be about 1.5 million. Cigarette tax, I think people are still going to smoke. And the other fund balance. So basically it comes down to, if we underperform by those factors, which is not unrealistic to suggest being conservative, that means that there would be $53 million roughly less revenue collected next year than what the manager is proposing in his budget that he will collect. So I hope he's right because then these offsets that I, I came up with to pay for that would be used for tax relief and that would be wonderful, though I, ex I expect that people will come up with ways to spend the money. Uh, one of the ways we can uh, cut expenses, or excuse me, cut appropriations for which there has been no his expense historically, is continuing to fully budget for positions that are never executed in aggregate. We carry about over 500 FTE vacancies every pay period. That's a historical documented number. So you put the average pay and salary for each position in the city when you divide the total burdened labor by the total FTEs is $76,342 per person per FTE. So if you just take half of that 500 and, you know, and say you're going to eliminate, remove them from the budget, not hold them till later to fill them later, you know, you're going to get half of $38 million. You're going to get $19 million of cost reduction 
a budget that's the current budget reflects for the most part, that's going to be money that you would have if those revenues that the city manager recommends would hold true. I'm thinking we're going to need that for offsets. If you took the other 125 and waited till January to fill those when you get an idea of what your budget is like, that's another $9 million. And if you sit, wait until the last quarter of the budget year to fill the balance of the 125 or total 250, you save another, you know, a couple million dollars. That all adds up to roughly uh, close to $40 million in, in savings. That is a budget reduction. I shouldn't say a savings because I'm offsetting the requirement. That requirement that we talked about, if we only collect 97% of the revenues. Now, the, the city manager, to his credit, did reduce the amount allocated for vehicle replacements in next year by a million bucks. But I think, you know, if we're in tighter times as we say we are, how many people and their families are buying new cars? I think we should zero out and say we're not going to buy any new vehicles next year. We'll just have to make do. That provides another $4,557,514. Does anyone think we really couldn't go a year without buying a new vehicle? I think we could. Now, another part that's in the budget, and the, and the, and the city manager mentioned this, that the General Assembly created what we always needed, another regional tax to provide uh, dollars for services to HRT. And the manager in his memo said, ultimately, that would allow us to reduce our uh, contribution to HRT by about $2 million. I couldn't find it in the budget. Maybe it's something when I missed it. But I think that's a $2 million should uh, go towards offsetting our structural shortfall if revenues are short. But if not, it could go into the, the kitty a council reserve to, to help us fund uh, tax relief, targeted tax relief for businesses, and also to reduce the real estate tax rate to the lower rate. More about that in a moment. Well, also, we're, we're giving out a pretty good penny to a lot of organizations and grants and nonprofits, all who do good things, all who do good things. But you know what? Families do a lot of good things. And I would uh, recommend an undistributed mark on that account. Uh, this manager, could we could decide how to do it. I'll leave it to the manager on a fair share. But I think there's $734,685 that we recoup. I know we don't certainly need to give $10,000 to the Chamber of Commerce. When you add up the labor offsets, vehicle procurement, HRT, organizational grants, that's $47.4 million. And we really haven't, except for the organizational grants, we really haven't touched anything. We limited jobs that weren't filled to start with historically on, a, on an aggregate basis, money coming from the state to replace the money that we're taking. So. Why aren't we talking about those kind of those savings? Now, that doesn't get you everywhere. Pretty much my capital improvement marks pretty match what is in the mayor and vice mayor's letter. Came to slightly different, but came about to the same total, $32 million. That's uh, not a bad uh, amount of money they'll be looking at. But then we also have these, what I would call council bills. The things that, some of these are things I would like to do to lower the real estate rate to the lowered rate would cost about nine fifteen million six hundred sixteen thousand. Now I know the VBA whose leadership who's quick not to do their homework uh, was sent us all a letter saying, oh, this would cost the schools to, to shut down and lay off teachers. Well, I didn't offset that amount by touching the schools. My whole offset for paying for the real estate tax reduction came out of the city's side of the budget. So they can all calm down and put their signs away. But uh, the other thing we need to do, and people hear a lot about, is we didn't eliminate the rain tax. There is no relationship between the tax, the fee, excuse me, the fee that people pay and the service provided. It'd be like having a public safety fee. Flood protection, flood mitigation, flood control, you name it, is a common good that no one individual can consume in part or generates in part, but benefits in totality as the public, and it has no business being a fee. It's very regressive. You know, it gets the people who rent apartments low income. So what we do instead, rather than reducing the fee and reducing the real estate tax, which benefits people, we keep the taxes in place and then ta take the taxes that people who can't afford to pay and use it to provide a, a grant or an, back to a benefit to a person and then count it as revenue. 
only government would come up with this self-circulating system when in reality they need to structurally fix it, reduce the fee, eliminate the fee over time, and let's just take care of flood control. What it is, it's like public safety, it's like fire prevent, fire protection, it's like emergency medical service. It's a basic common good and should be the tax base and should not be this regressive fee. And we easily can find $5 million. Then there was a discussion about wanting to increase the, the ads uh, campaign. I like the solution, the hybrid budget uh, um, much better. I wasn't certain there'd be a coalition to uh, do that, but I, I do like that approach and that would affect my choice. I was just gonna find uh, other offsets, which I did. And then there was a discussion about how can we provide um, targeted grants to businesses who because of the government closing them down and not able to operate or effectively not able to operate, that their revenues in March and April or June of this year are different than they were a year ago, and how could they have a plan that was adequately funded that would allow them to apply, and then they would have to use that grant to what? To pay their property taxes. And there was some discussion both from industry and from some council members, and I allotted $18 million for that. And then there was the miscellaneous things, which were the African American Museum, the CERC Museum, the workforce plan, all those things, and that came just a little bit under $3 million. So that means on that shopping list, so to speak, of council's desires of ad backs, that was $51.6 million. So I had a shortfall against the $32 million credit of $22.6 million. $22 million. That's, a, that's still a lot of money. Uh, so I went and looked and said, where could you find uh, additional funds? So like doing detailed work, like we should all be doing, I hope. I went through and looked at every departmental page, every exhibit through the operating budget, uh, like I did with the CIP, and like I'm sure uh, members of council looked at the CIP as well, and the staff. And uh, I have an itemized reduction in the spreadsheet. I won't do that, but I came up with $13.4 million. Do so I think all those reductions would find six votes? Nope. But I'm trying to show people the potential of what, this is what families have to do with their budgets because they're not getting a 3% increase in spending or a one, or maybe they're getting bigger than a one-tenth of 1% 1 reduction in their family income. And they're looking at things much more austere than the choices here. Then I think the fuel cost, which I'm surprised how little that is. I'd like to know how many gallons of gas we consume and what the price market. But the, if you look at gas prices today on the wholesale before taxes, they've dropped phenomenally. And in all the vehicles we have, I'm surprised it's only 168,000. It might not be 2 million, but I'm certain it's more than 168,000. We should be capturing that market differential and that's a long-term structural change and we should be getting a lot more money out of that. And then this is one that I know that's never popular among us, some members of us, but it's popular with the public. Where is, where is the leadership skin in this game? Where is it that, the people who are at the very pinnacles, at the very top, uh, who are getting these car allowances on top of very competitive salaries. I personally think that we should send an optic message. I know it's more optics and symbolic than material, but I think, you know, leadership should be the place that's making the sacrifices first. And we're not doing that. So I would eliminate all the car allowances, constitutional officers. They want to run for office and claim they need $8,000, $10,000 car, car allowance. You know, more power to them. But I think people should step up to the plate and there ought to be some sacrifice at the top. I'd even be in favor of cutting council salaries as well. I mean, I don't think anyone does this job for the money and the sacrifice starts at the top. So I put a place marker in there for $150,000 for eliminating the car allowance. That still left me... $6.3 million short. Um, so these are the things that but you've now taken one of them was the Princeton High School thing, but also I got 600,000. If we can't reduce taxes for the general public and we can't reduce fees on people, and I'm not claiming that's me, but I know people who are, and churches that are struggling with less collections who are paying that stormwater management fee, but yet, we could find $600,000 so that employees who do a great job are protected from having to pay their share of health insurance growth. 
I'm all in favor of paying that, but I'm not in favor of paying that bill when I can't do anything for the people across the board and not just the extremely destitute. That looks like we're taking care of ourselves first. I think that's a bad optic. You know, we're retaining the positions. You know, I'm all in favor of the midpoint supervisory thing for public safety, but do we really need to implement that citywide in an austere environment? Are those people's jobs? I think these are things we have to think about because we're asking people to pay a high, we put a real estate rate went up 2.7%, I think, on people on, on existing homes on average. We're asking them to pay more, but yet they have less. This seems to be like we 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 have the, the wrong approach. So there was still a little bit of balance. So at the end, I had to reduce another 94 positions out of that original 250 that I was going to retain the balance. But my point being is those vacancies, there's no one in those jobs. And I didn't see a white flag going up at City Hall or across the city saying we surrender. We can't get, you know, it's tough, it's challenging. But so is the lives of every citizen resident of Virginia Beach. And I think for a year we could remove most of that out of the budget, not appropriate money for that purpose, and use that, that things we say we're going to collect revenue. And if we believe that higher end revenue number, which I question, then we ought to be giving that back and pay our businesses and our people first, and then lower our threshold. I like the idea of having a fund and water enterprise for people who can't pay. But I do think all that should come out of the water enterprise fund and we shouldn't be using the general fund, a uh, fund balance to provide that. Let's maintain the integrity of the fund. I like the approach that you've used with having and drawing down the balance of those funds. I, but I didn't see us defer and push out the dome side or push out 17th uh, street modernization plans. That doesn't give us any money, but it does provide relief in the budget after next, which we'll have. So we don't incur borrowing costs that we then have to what issue bonds to pay for and replenish it. So I think uh, the budget is based on an unrealistic, the hybrid thing is based on an un unrealistic revenue collection. Uh, I do appreciate the fact that you listened to our comments last week and you've got these reserves that you set aside. So I say, keep those reserves and then take some of these marks that's in what I propose, and let's provide tax relief. Of the majority of the people that spoke at our public hearing said what? Lower the real estate rate. The majority of the business people said what? We need targeted tax relief. This budget doesn't do either of those things. It's just an incremental inertial continuation of this of what we had when I think the times demand us to make some structural changes. I don't think, Susan has some work on my house, apologize about that underneath, unfortunately. But, uh, but we just can't uh, just continue to say, we're gonna march along, preserve all the positions, we're gonna do a little adjustment here and just try to, to muddle through because that's not going to work. I don't think anyone that I talk to who who isn't running for re-election, maybe that, and I understand that's a that's a context of all this, but the things you do now, because it seems like it's easy, easier, the time to make the hard choices is when the public's expecting that there's hard choices that have to be made because they're making them themselves. And yet we're not making those hard choices with this budget. We just are not, and we're not giving people the, the tax relief and the fee relief that they need to just maybe hopefully make ends meet. I, I, I don't know that everybody travels in their own circles, but what I hear is What's the city going to what's the city going to do? So while I applaud and we should be able to do the things that are in here to help people on a targeted basis for total relief, we have the ability and the capacity to grant broad based tax relief to everyone, but that means we have to reduce the city's appetite 
And the city is not an entity separate from the people who own it. But yet this budget reflects preservation of the city at the expense of imposing additional financial stress on its stockholders. And it's just, to me, it's, it's fascinating that we've ended up at this point. Uh, I'm sure I have uh, maybe exhausted people's uh, patience, but I have spent a lot of time looking at this budget. There is room to cut, to reduce. I don't just say cut. That's a, it's, there are requirements in that budget that are good requirements, but they're not a higher priority requirement than granting broad-based and more targeted tax relief to businesses. The, the city is not more important than the people that it serves. And that's what this hybrid budget message it sends to me. I appreciate all the work that's gone on. It's certainly better than the thing that we saw last week. And it certainly could be much better, I would hope, on the 12th. But, we're, but why are we on this rush to adopt on the 12th? You know, I think Aaron was right when he said, uh, I should say Councilman Rouse was right when he said, we need a lot more workshops. Uh, but I'm going to take the hybrid budget. I'm going to take my work. Uh, over here the next couple of days and try to take the best of both of those and see where compromise might not be doable. But as it stands, the, the current hybrid budget does not meet the public's expectation for tax and fee relief. Thank you so much. Are there any other council additional council members with comments or questions? If so, raise your virtual hand. Any additional council members wishing to make comments? Mayor, I do not see anyone raising their virtual hand. Okay, Madam Clerk, at this point, uh, could we ask each council member their thoughts about moving uh, this budget to a vote next Tuesday? If you can go through. Is that okay. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, um, Council Member Abbott has raised her virtual hand now. Councilmember Abbott. I apologize. I've been having a little bit of a technical difficulty with my internet connection. So I apologize if I'm cutting in and out. I my whole my whole WebEx went down a few minutes ago, so that's why I was late to raising my virtual hand. Um, I didn't hear all of Councilman Moss's comments, but I, I did want to touch a little bit more on the budget. Um, I haven't had a chance to really go through the letter that was sent to us this afternoon. Um, I do like a lot of what was included in it. Um, I'm sure that I'm aligned with Councilman Moss on that. I feel like we should be able to do more for uh, residents. I wanted to kind of share with a little bit of the insight that I'm seeing. I, since I interact with many members of the public of all different types of economic statuses in our city on a regular basis, um, one of the things that I've I've been taking an increase in phone calls during at my day job is how much money are is their insurance company going to be giving back to them? And I'm not really interested in giving any particular insurance company a shout out, but just about all of the top insurance companies in the country are rebating between 500 million and 2 billion, $3 billion in premiums back to clients, which is, is coming up to be about a 15% policy refund for the months that COVID-19 impacted. And this is breaking down between 30 and $50 a vehicle. The reason I bring this up is because many residents that I've spoken to that live in our city are literally scraping the bottom of the barrel for $10, $12. And when they're being told by uh, an insurance carrier that they're gonna get a little bit of money back, even though 30, 50, you know, even $100 doesn't sound like a lot of money, it's adding up to the totality of their financial responsibility. So I, I do believe that there is a precedent being set both in the private sector and in municipalities around the country that are as reflecting this need to make sure that we are prioritizing our residents. And so I, I hope that we are not at a place to quite say, you know, to, to the mayor's question, I'm not confident saying I'm ready to adopt this version of the budget uh, next week. I hope we have a little bit more conversation considering 
Uh, I think this letter was sent to us around early, early or late morning, early afternoon. I don't know how many of you have had had a chance to really dig into it. I know that I'm working uh, full time in addition to this job as well. So, uh, not to mention balancing all of our normal responsibilities. So, I think that it would be best for us to have an additional dialogue. Personally, that's where I feel we should be at. Um, I'm not confident in any direction that we're we're prepared to pass a budget, but um, that's. I just wanted to share some insights. I, I, I mean, I when I say that we, I talk to literally all different kinds of people that has nothing to do with city council. They're just telling me about their their individual financial burdens. I think that we are going to see a larger group of people who are going to need help, and so I think it, we might be better served to broad brush. Um, our relief to everybody at, right out the gate. So just some thoughts. Okay, once again, I wanna invite council to participate in a discussion about you know, m moving to uh, scheduling this sort of vote on Tuesday. Anybody would like to participate, you know, please do so. Um, I actually have a council member Tower would like to have, has a question and then council member Barbara Henley. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I appreciate the work that's gone into the uh, additional revisions to the reconciliation letter, and they certainly are responsive in many ways to the questions that I raised last week. And I have one more question. I haven't had a chance to digest the letter and would like more opportunity to do so. And while I've got the floor, I'll say, I. I don't have I don't have any urgency to pass this budget next week. Uh, I would be happy to have more discussions about it. I have more questions than answers. So uh, further discussion would suit me and I, I would say we use all the time we have uh, while moving the other agendas forward as well. My question is this. I'm trying to understand why it is not better to reduce spending now and restore it if we have the revenues rather than create a lot of reserves from which we can sort of allocate funds later, but without reducing the top line but uh, revenue expenditures. I could see it in a case where there was uh, a murky future. Uh, we weren't quite sure how the economy was going to do, whether it was going to continue as, it's been, as it was or get better or worse. I don't know of anybody who thinks the economy in the next year is going to be better than it was last year. It could make a significant rebound from where it is now and still be much worse than it was last year. And that's assuming it makes a significant rebound. If, it, if the rebound is less significant, it would be even less than next year. I'm just trying to understand from a budgeting standpoint for a city government, why we would not make cuts now and then restore them as we went along rather, rather than it seems to me there's an opportunity for us to dig ourselves a deeper hole if we have a really big shortfall. Whereas if we made some cuts now and operated as if those cuts were going to happen rather than, than as if they weren't going to happen, uh, we, we, could, we could be more nimble, we could respond better to changes in financial condition, whether they be good or whether they be bad. And I don't need, I'm not asking for anyone to answer that question right now. I'd be happy to hear from anybody, but I just want my fellow council members to know it's a real nagging question for me. It's, uh, it's a philosophical question about how you go about this process um, that I would like to have answered, whether it be by staff or other council members or any other way, I'd appreciate input. Thank you. Are we, is someone going to respond to Mr. Tower now or just respond later? 
my question. Okay, Mr. Bradley. Yes, M Mr. Tower, um, you know, we are not going to be expending much into salaries going forward into <clears throat> this uh, upcoming fiscal year. Um, and, and please note, too, you know, in the general fund under the proposal before this reconciliation, the general fund's going down $11 million um, with the city manager's revised uh, budget. Um, I, I was looking at some of the uh, revenues because um, I know there was concern last week that we hadn't reduced enough. So, for example, we have sales going down, um, sa sales tax revenue 5 percent compared to the adjusted budget. Um, we have, uh, uh, which, which equates to about uh, $3 million. We have uh, business license actually going down 11 percent. Um, by about um, $5.6 million. We have hotel tax, and this, you know, once again, the 21 revised budget to the 20 going down 28% compared to the uh, adjusted budget, which is ele almost $11 million. We have the restaurant tax going down about 17%, which is about $12 million. And amusement tax, we actually almost took in half, um, and that's going down by 3.3. Uh, so, you know, when we were talking about that kind of gradual um, increase through December, I just I just wanted to make sure city council and the citizens were aware. We also um, showed real estate tax, personal property, and B poll going down, and those impacts would occur at the end of next fiscal year in spring of 21. Um, the insulating factor right now, the way this, the revised budget is the real estate tax. Those assessments are in place, and that's about one third of your non uh, enterprise fund uh, funds. So that's kind of the insulating factor. Just directly to your question, you know, I, I think when you're looking at, you know, uh, significant cuts to the budget, the question is, is it going to go um, for a long period of time? Is this a you know, a multi multi year issue. I think what the city manager is trying to do is to create that flexibility in the budget where by not hiring positions and delaying uh, non essential expenditures, if those decisions have to be made, uh, and believe me, you know, th there's, <laughs> there's no advantage for the staff or anybody to be overly optimistic with revenue. We we are going to have to stay on this over the next year, um, meet monthly, you know, as that information comes in and see where we're at, um, you know, and so we will have to look and see if we're meeting revenue estimates. So, you know, that was his approach about delaying expenditures and freezing positions. That will create that flexibility if we need to go further. As far as the decision on the CIP, um, I think the idea was take that $21, $22 million, $21.8 million, and we're just not going to spend it. Um, that also can be used as a revenue shortfall. So, you know, given the, the, that all this happened in five weeks, I think the idea was try to create flexibility to see how, how we may have to adjust going forward. So I hope that answered your question somewhat. Council member Barbara Henley. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, um, I did get a chance to review the letter uh, that was sent. Uh, as a matter of fact, I sent you all uh, some of my comments yesterday uh, based on the uh, reconciliation letter that we had last week. I hope you had a chance to read that. Um, and I did get to review the one today and looked at that and appreciate that, even though all of this is happening right at our very busiest time of year. And thankfully, we are having a very busy time of year. I'm so glad that the strawberry crop is great and people want to pick them. Um, but anyway, uh, I think we have a lot of flexibility in this budget. And I think there were a lot of cuts made from the original budget uh, until now, certainly the, the big one, uh, that uh, our employees uh, are, are feeling, of course, is the uh, loss of their uh, 
proposed uh, increase, as well as the school board people losing their proposed increase. There have been a lot of cuts. Um, and I think it's important that we clarify that we are not raising the tax rate, the real estate tax rate. Uh, yes, there are some uh, increases to some people because their property values uh, increased with their assessments. And so that's why we are considering this quote, a tax increase. But 20% of the residential properties actually saw a decrease in their assessments and 3% stayed the same of the 77% residential properties that did have uh, some increased assessment. They would be varying amounts from very small to, to maybe a little bit more. And so that's where uh, the tax increase comes in. And of course that would first be felt in the December payment of uh, the one that is being uh, collected uh, soon uh, is based on our current tax, as I believe I said last week. So I think we do have a lot of flexibility, and I think that all of these things that we have mentioned and that we heard Mr. Moss indicate and, and uh, so forth are things that we could consider as we go forward uh, if we need to. And I think that, as I said in my comments uh, in the in the email that I sent you yesterday, I think we have to have a starting point, and I'm comfortable with this uh, starting point because I think there already have been substantial um, uh, set asides that we can look at if we need to. Um, but as I said in my comments to you, I think one of the big things we have to focus on now is the tax relief programs, are the tax relief programs that we have to make certain that all of our people are aware of what these offerings are and are, are take advantage of them if we need to. I certainly want to make certain that uh, we don't find that the folks who are just more connected and um, more aware are the ones who get that tax relief if we're doing it on a first come first serve basis for some of these programs and that others just kind of lose out. So I hope that we will have a very aggressive uh, program for uh, going forward and uh, with our assistance programs, as I described. And I think that there are things that we probably need as a council uh, to ask. And, and as we see these programs and these tax relief uh, opportunities laid out to make certain that they do uh, reach those people that we need and that we have an opportunity to identify any gaps that we might see. Uh, particularly as the letter that uh, the city manager sent in our Friday packet in response to my inquiry about just enumerating what these are. I think that there are things that we need to, uh, to do so that we make sure our people are taking advantage of these. And I, I'm, I'm looking particularly at the first one that he listed, and that's the real estate tax relief program we have for elderly and disabled and disabled veterans. And, and, and that, of course, is also available for personal property tax for those folks as well. And we already have a lot of folks who take advantage of that every year. But I'm kind of thinking that with the stay at home requirements, we may need to uh, give a little more time for people to make certain that they uh, have all of their uh, their application in place for this year. So I'm going to ask that we look at that to see if there's any action that we might need to take to give folks more time to make sure that they are taking advantage of it. And I know a lot of folks who are elderly are reluctant to take advantage of things like this, but we have to make sure that they feel very comfortable. And some folks who maybe didn't uh, uh, qualify before with investment decreases may qualify now. So I hope we'll give a lot of attention to these programs that we're offering. And then we can go on down, you know, of course, the uh, suspending the penalties for late payment of the trustee tax that that uh, will help our businesses and will help our individuals because we also are allowing uh, uh, no penalties and interest for late payment of real estate and personal property tax this year uh, that, that's due now. Of course, the meals tax suspension and the, the uh, volunteer uh, folks being able to uh, make sure that they apply for that this year as well as next year to not have to pay a vehicle tax. Of course, this appropriation of the $2 million in the CARES Act uh, for the rental assessment, uh, rent assistance program, I think that's had a, a, a major 
uh, application, we might want to look at that and see if there are gaps we might want to supplement. Of course, today we added another million dollars into the EDIP uh, for our small businesses, and I would really like to hear back uh, from um, uh, the economic development folks to see who applied and how how much the the uh, um, applications exceeded our capability to follow it. We might want to look at that. Of course, we talked about the changing. Uh, some of the tip and the tap money so that our marketing can be better. We've got the um, uh, utility uh, bill, and I think that's going to be a, a big assist to folks to who who are having difficulty paying their uh, utility bill, or everybody calls it the water bill. Uh, we have um, a good amount of money apply uh, there. I think four million dollars. I will want to hear back to see how much in excess of that is applied for. Do we need to look at more money there? And today, of course, we added this other one, uh, which would be uh, uh, $3 million tax relief plan to uh, provide for uh, folks who need some help with their real estate and property tax. It doesn't tell us here who is going to administer that and how it's going to be administered. I would like to, to hear about that. And I really think that the council is in the ideal position to be able to give the feedback and hear back from our folks, whether or not they uh, understood these, these opportunities, if they're taking advantage of them. If we can help get the word out, I think we should. I think what we have to do now is have a very robust uh, outreach program to make certain that our people know about these opportunities and take advantage of them, and that we have an opportunity to make adjustments uh, if we see that, that, that it's needed and that we can. So I, I think we've got a, a great, uh, uh, conglomeration here, not only within the budget, but also in our relief programs that have been able to be pulled together very quickly. And I really think the staff has done a great job in helping us do this. And I, I just say thank you. Council member Rosemary Wilson. Thank you, Amanda. Um, Barbara, you covered things so well. Uh, it, all of these relief programs show why we were named the most caring city, because these are relief programs to help people who need them. Uh, and it shows that Jim and Bobby, what a great job you did in putting this reconciliation letter together. It's not easy listening to 11 people and trying to come up with a compromise and trying to find out, you know, how we're going to put this together. And, and there may not be everything in there that everybody wants. Um, that's what compromise is, but they listened and there's a lot of things in there to help people who are going to need it. And we've, we've really done that. And you look and you read a, the paper about what some of the other cities are doing and we really don't see them doing these kind of things. And we've got to also be very careful. We've got to be careful because we don't know what's coming up. We don't know, um, how it's going to turn we don't want to block ourselves in too hard in case we we need we may have to make further cuts and people don't think we're cutting things we are there are cuts in this budget there's some deep cuts for us and there's deep cuts for our school board and but we really need to be careful we don't know if we're going to you know hurricane season's coming along or or you know the revenues are going to be worse so this is, like Barbara said, this is a first step. Um, we need to be agile. We need to be careful. And we need to be together. This council needs to be together to show the public that we're the caring city, that we're there for them, and we're going to get, all get through this together. And, and I really want to thank the mayor and the vice mayor for all that they've done. Council member John Moss. I do think a lot of hard work's been done by a lot of people, and I and I think hard work is what we're supposed to do. But there are a couple of things I would just like to correct. We are increasing the real estate tax rate, or we would not have had a public hearing that's required by state law when you're increasing the real estate tax rate, because the state law requires us to lower the real estate rate tax rate to make it revenue neutral for the tax base that existed 
on the when the book value was established, and then we can add the new property on top of that that was created during that year, which means our tax rate under state law, if we took no action, would be 0.9919, I believe. That would be the real estate tax rate. So we have to consciously vote, the key word, consciously vote, to, to push it back up to 1.0175, a dollar and one cent and three quarters of a cent. That is a tax increase by any mathematical definition. Now you can say, and I would say, that we're maintaining the current rate that exists in this year, but we are, in fact, or who votes for this budget, is voting to increase the real estate tax rate. Now, let's just talk a little bit to put it in perspective about, before we over-congratulate ourselves on what we're doing, is we have seen statistics that the delinquency rate and how many people can't pay their water bills, I've seen numbers as high as 20%, but I just want to use 10%. 10% of 135,000 customers, that's a proxy. So that's 13,500, that's 162,000 billing months. So $4 million on the water and sewer, and I guess they have to call it for trash fee, we could provide to those group of people, which is not insignificant, but it's about $24 a month, each month, which is not insignificant, but it isn't like it's the whole bill they're going to get. So I think we need to understand when people put a number out there, it's like that money we had to give businesses, is don't overstate that that's, that it's like, oh, they're able to get their whole bill paid because if that's the case, there's a lot fewer of those folks you can help. And therefore lowering the overall rate for everyone in a, in a lot of places comes back and might get you that same, might get you that same benefit. So I think it's important to recognize that I do appreciate Ms. Emily's comment about first come, first serve. That has always been a concern. I think we ought to always have periods where you apply and it's set. And if it, then if it's oversubscribed, you have to come to some lottery or some other method. So it isn't who's best informed, who has the best transportation, who has the best access to computers get determined if they get a need. But when something's oversubscribed, we need a much more small D democratic way of uh, allocating those benefits. So it, it happens and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to hear her say that. Um, people say there's lots of cuts. That's also a misnomer. Yes, he cut $64 million of money we never had. I can say I cut my salary $100,000. I never had it. You can't cut what you never had. What you're really saying is I'm not gonna spend as much. When you ask how much we really cut, which means how much less does this budget actually spend than last year? Or should it discount the reserve amounts? It's $2.3 million. That's right in his own memo. It's one-tenth of 1% 1 when you put the, all the pieces together, the schools, the city, and the CIP. The amount is one-tenth of 1% 1 less what we had this year. 2 million, 80, 2 million, 80 million, he goes down to 2 million, 78, 2 billion, 78 million. So it's, there's not big cuts. We cut out a lot of growth because the money's not there, but cutting growth is not cutting, you know, because you never had it to start with. So we aren't making the same, I'm sure families have seen their income reduce more than one-tenth of 1%. 1 what do you bet? So I, I don't think we can make a compelling case. Now, someone might make the case, I haven't heard it tonight, that the city really has needs that are more important than individuals. And sorry, you need to make the sacrifice because what we're delivering to you is we can't go below here. We're at the bone, there's no way, but your personal discretionary incomes goes down, but you've got to keep sending your money down to city hall as usual. I haven't heard that compelling case. I certainly wouldn't make it, but to say that we made these big cuts, not true. The math doesn't show that we do. Now, I'm not in favor of having a vote on the 12th. It's not required to have one on the 12th. There is no statutory penalty for going past the 15th of May. I've explained that many times. But if there are six people, maybe there's not eight because you can't, you can't issue general obligation bonds unless you have eight votes. If you have six votes for the operating budget and they're there, then I think the sooner the public knows what 
the council majority wants and has decided that there's a budget that asks them to sacrifice more than the city has to, as a government is sacrificing, the better off we all are to have that decision behind us. And then the voting public can make their judgment on our performance at the appropriate time and place. And we can move on to the other business of the city. If, however, there are a majority who feel that, you know, may, I don't think anyone's going to say, like Mr. Boss, say, and I understand that. I'm, I'm pushing the envelope to get a better deal for businesses and residents. But it's certainly we can do better than what we got today, just like we did better than what we got last week. It's not the best that we can do, in my opinion. Thank you. Councilmember Berlucci, and then after Mr. Berlucci will be Councilmember Rouse. Well, thank you. I think I'd like to take a moment to speak to the mayor's original question, which was um, individual council members' thoughts about uh, moving forward with a budget uh, vote on May 12th. And I would like to um, just point out that we do have a workshop scheduled for this Thursday, uh, which, which I think we have a substantial amount of time set aside to have hopefully in-person dialogues about the very uh, questions that are being posed today and um, about what are the best strategies to implement and adopt a budget. And so I think we have a responsibility to the people of Virginia Beach to move forward in spite of difficult circumstances. And I would like to um, consider that we could prepare ourselves to work hard this week, to um, have a productive meeting on Thursday to uh, work hard together and hopefully have a budget to consider on the 12th. Uh, but one thing I'd also like to point out that I think is very important that has not been part of our discussions to date. Uh, today, we received a letter from uh, the superintendent of schools and the school board, and there's been quite a tremendous amount of discussion about how these rates impact the budgets and city services, uh, but there has been, uh, to my knowledge, very little or no exploration about how um, these uh, proposed reductions in the rates will impact schools. And I'm not making a, a policy determination one side or the other at, at this point, but I think we have an obligation to at least consider the impacts that the uh, revenue sharing formula will have on our public education system, strong public schools, is one of our principal responsibilities of maintaining an excellent public education system, which we do have. Uh, we know that as a result of the um, revenue sharing formula, uh, that much of the meals taxes and hotel taxes and other uh, parts of the school's budgets are reduced as a result of this COVID-19 impact. And um, because of the deferrals and property taxes and some of the other discussions that it could be reduced further. And it's our obligation to know uh, what the impact of schools um, and on uh, young people and teachers and families who are already having an extremely difficult school year uh, will have into the future. So I just want to make that point and take a moment to advocate for students and schools and teachers because uh, that's one of our principal and primary obligations is to maintain an excellent public education system. So we should be. Uh, we should be considering that when we have these discussions. Thank you. Council member Rouse. I'll look forward to um, back to the mayor's questions. I look forward to having a, a productive uh, um, meeting and conversation on Thursday to um, discuss the ongoing uh, budget concerns. Um, I like their approach so far, thus taking on this uh, hybrid, uh, if you will, um, budget reconciliation, but I also just want to keep um, council, uh, council should keep in mind that whatever budget we, we do adapt, we should be looking at it every single month um, and make adjustments um, every single month where it need be to find um, the offsets, um, basically, uh, and let our revenues determine uh, what type of adjustments we make. Um, so. Uh, that's keeping that flexibility alive and with the uncertainty of our of our economy and future, we should be looking at the budget um, every single month. Um, a question for Mr. Leahy or Mr. Bradley, if you could answer this for me. Um, exactly where is our 
general fund um, reserves are now. And I ask that, um, I'd like to know where they are now because, you know, if it's, here's an idea and it's up to council, um, but if we could, or if we would uh, take funds from the, out of the general fund reserves to uh, make sure we can keep those programs going, such as um, the real estate tax relief or personal property tax relief, or making sure our helping our schools out where where there where there um, any come shortfalls from there, but um, you know I think that's up to council to determine um, uh, exactly if we could take uh, set aside money from my general fund reserves um, to make sure we are that caring city um, that that we so claim to be um, to help people out um, throughout this COVID uh, pandemic. Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rouse. Yeah, I think I can answer your question. And I, I think what you're specifically asking about is our fund balance. So when we submitted the budget on March 24th, we had our fund balance, what we call undesignated, unassigned fund balance of the general fund at 10.3% of the following year's revenue. And, you know, your the council policy is 8 to 12%. It's something that the bond market is looking at as well. And one of the things that we heard from your initial discussions as a council is this is the time to use the rainy day fund. Um, so, you know, rainy day fund doesn't exist in the terminology of our city, but I interpreted that and the city manager interpreted that as, well, you know, let's get down to the minimum of our fund balance policy um, and still meet our requirements. So when we submitted the uh, April 10th letter. We were down to 8.45 percent of next year's fund, uh, next year's revenue, just above the 8 percent number, and that number is now just under 100 million dollars. So 99.7 million dollars is 8.45 percent of the following year's revenue. Um, with some of the changes that have occurred uh, in this reconciled budget. Um, that the mayor and vice mayor have uh, brought forward, we're going to be using fund balance even more. So I think it's getting to your point to try to do that. $1.6 million is being used for that um, city services bill uh, relief, and then another $2 million is being used for property acquisition uh, in the southern part of the city to you know, help offset flooding land. Those two initiatives right there will bring you down to about 8.1 or so percent, and that's where we feel like we're at the limit of what the general fund fund balance usage can be. Councilmember Rouse, did you have additional questions or comments? Yes, you, you say you're, Mr. Bradley, just a moment. Um, you say you're, you're at that limit. It, you call that limit before it starts affecting our, um, our, our bond um, rating. A bond rating, and uh, one of you know, and one of it is they look Mr. at our Bradley, fund balance. Mr. Bradley, I'm sorry, we'll need you to start over. Okay, you, I'm sorry. Can we go? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me start again. So, um, you know, our fund balance is one of the things that the bond market is looking for. Um, as a matter of fact, and I, I think Alice Kelly, when she gave a presentation several weeks ago. One of the things that, um, you know, so when we, you know, everybody's looking at every city's revenue picture right now, everybody is concerned. And one of the concerning groups is the people that invest in our city through the purchase of our bonds. So the advice that we've been getting from PRAG, uh, Public Resources Advisory Group, that's our financial advisors in New York City. As she said several weeks ago, and, and she reiterated today, they recommend not, uh, for example, reducing rates because the same concerns that investors have to make sure that we have liquidity, which is our fund balance and our cash position, and flexibility, which is what we're trying to create in the budget process. So, you know, they're concerned that investors will look at um, 
our budget, and, and they want to make sure that as they invest that they're going to get, uh, you know, their, their debt payments. So, you know, there are a lot of factors that go into uh, a, a rating to get to a, a AAA, but fund balance is certainly one of the critical ones. Mr. Rouse, any other questions or comments? Um, my notion for, for asking uh, our fund balance, and understandably, if there was was any point in time um, our AAA bond rating was going to take a hit, I would imagine it would be uh, amidst that of a global pandemic. Um, but my, my terms and, and, and notion of asking that is to make sure, as Ms. Henley, um, you know, Councilman, Councilwoman Henley stated earlier, is to find, you know, necessary relief um, for not only our businesses, but our residents as, as well, um, in form of personal property tax or real estate tax um, relief. And it looks like we've, we've used some of the fund balance, um, you know, for purchase of sort of water, watershed and, and other things on that notion. Um, but I just also wanted just to reiterate to the council that, you know, being that our revenues uh, forecasts are uncertain, that regardless of the budget we, we do pass, each and every month, we're gonna to have to take a hard look at it and make the necessary, um, you know, adjustment and, and adaptation. So um, that'd be all, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Wooten, and then after Ms. Wooten will be Vice Mayor Wood. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, I'm always actively seeking creative ways to save taxpayers money and to make sure that our city government is running uh, efficiently and effectively. And so um, I'm actively also reviewing um, the information I received regarding reconciliation um, and all the other uh, opportunities and options that uh, council member, um, uh, council member, I'm, I'm sorry, um, that have been set forth by some of the other council members here. And so um, what I'm looking for, I, I did hear council member Berlucci make a comment about our schools. Uh, there was some discussion about um, reducing the tax rate. And I wanted to see if Mr. Bradley could speak to um, how will that impact our schools? Because that's very important to me our schools have um, already had to make a, uh, a huge adjustment in their budget, and um, I don't want to impact them negatively uh, in the future going forward. So I'd like to know how that tax rate uh, decrease would impact our schools. Uh, wait. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Sure. yes sure. You're fine. All right. Thank, thank you, Ms. Wooten. So I have a, a slide uh, I think is going to become yeah. available. So the right, right now, oh, here it is. Thank you. So um, when, when we sent the uh, April 10th letter, that changed the funding formula by $20.4 million. And that's what the schools has already adopted. So all those changes in revenue that we've been talking about today in the previous meeting impacted the schools by $20.4 million. And they also, I believe, uh, reduced state revenue by maybe $6 million when they took their action uh, last Tuesday. So that's done and complete. What you're looking here at the slide, a question had come up and is if, if uh, we reduce the, uh, the tax rate to the effective tax rate, what would be the impact? Um, and this is solely by the funding formula. I think Mr. Moss and his proposal so no, the city would take it all. So that would be a, a decision, uh, you know, take the hit a, 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 in total. So it would have to be a decision by city council. But this is just the way the funding formula works by council policy to date. So you can see that if the tax rate was lowered from uh, the dollar one and three quarters of a cent to 99.2 cent, uh, the general fund would lose $7.4 million. Uh, the schools, the transfer from the general fund would be a negative 6.3 million. But there's other council de dedications in place too uh, that have been in place in, in many, in some cases, for many years. 
outdoor initiative, the $68,000, um, the general fund has historically contributed to the, the Parks and Rec CIP um, for um, their infrastructure needs. If you recall, over the last, uh, I guess, two years, council has lot boxed two and a half cent of the real estate tax in the general fund. So that'd be $364,000. So that's kind of directly related to the flooding concerns that, you know, council has tried to address over the last three years. The rec centers, they get basically three and a half cent dedication of the real estate tax. So that's a half a million dollars. The Agricultural Reserve Program gets part of the real estate tax. That's $131,000. And then, excuse me, then you have the Town Center TIF, uh, which would be a loss of $226,000. So you can see in total, it's about $15.1 million. And like I say, that's just based on the funding formulas that are in place at this time. Councilmember Wooten, did you have additional questions or comments? No, thank you very much. Vice Mayor Wood. Thank you. Um, just a, a couple of points of clarification. Uh, first off, the um, what we're looking for direction for today is we're actually looking for direction today so that staff can prepare the ordinances for the budget. It is a very time consuming, laborious process where they have to add in uh, all the figures and make sure everything balances and, and work back and forth on that. So it does take them several days to do that. So by, by getting direction today, we'll be able to vote on it on um, on Tuesday. It also gives the staff opportunity to do the requisite advertising and things like that. Um, so so that's, that's the direction I believe the mayor is looking for is to see if there's a uh, consensus to to move forward on the operating budget and the CIP budget as we've got here. Um, with, with respect to, and I just wanted to clarify this with the city attorney, with respect to the, the comments that we are not required to have a budget by a certain date, it's my understanding that while there is no penalty, it remains unlawful to not have such a budget. And if I could get Mr. Stiles to comment on that, and then I have one more thing. Uh, yes, Vice Mayor, the Virginia Code says that um, the uh, budget providing funding for schools uh, should be passed or will be passed by May the 15th. Uh, there is uh, no penalty for not doing it, but that is what the law uh, requires. Vice Mayor Wood. Okay, so so basically what we're saying is even though there is no penalty, it would be unlawful. And and that that's the point I wanted to make is, you know, and it's certainly up to the will of the council. I'm I don't I don't intend to do anything that's unlawful regardless of, of what the penalty is. Um I, I do appreciate Mr. Rouse's comments regarding the general fund and I appreciate Mr. Bradley's response to that. I th I think Mr. Rouse is is right on. You know, it's it's the rainiest of rainy days that we've experienced. Um what I would say is and, and I think, again, Mr. Rouse is correct about this, that, uh, you know, there could be an issue with our bond rating. I don't want there to be an issue with our bond rating because, you know, we, we are going to get through this and, and we need to make sure that we maintain our AAA bond rating. So I, I do appreciate that. I do appreciate Mr. Bradley providing the information on the impact on the bond rating. Uh, also, uh, the answering Ms. Wooten, Ms. Wooten's question on the impact using the funding formula on on these sorts of things. And, and one thing I would ask Mr. Bradley, uh, well, no, I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll frame for that. You, you've, you've given us a good bit of information, that, but but just just for direction for the council, you know, we're, we're looking to uh, to get direction today so that this can be on the agenda for Tuesday. The special meeting on Thursday will will address what is going to be in the upcoming budget in terms of logistics, but and as well as some other items that the mayor has put on there. But but we do need to get some direction today. Council member Henley, and then after Ms. Henley will be council member Moss. Uh, some of that discussion did precipitate one question for me. As far as our, our uh, fund balance, I know our policy has been that we would retain in the fund balance between eight and 12% of the 
upcoming year's revenues. And I think historically we usually hit around 10% and that's where we started out with this budget to begin with. But now we brought it down very close to 8%. And I, I certainly think that it's important that we don't go below uh, that because that is our rainy day fund. And I seem to remember in Matthew, we had to use a good bit of our fund balance. And I was just going to ask Mr. Bradley if he remembered uh, what it was that we had to uh, look to our fund balance for at Matthew, because as uh, Ms. Sutton had said earlier at the beginning, uh, today is the beginning of the hurricane season. And we have to remember that we've got another very critical issue in our city other than this virus, and that is flooding. And we have to certainly not um, do anything that's going to cause that issue to worsen. And just what what was our experience with Matthew, if, if anybody remembers exactly or something close? Um, Mr. Bradley. Miss, Miss Henley, so, um, the, uh, the and I, I think I'm right within a million, I believe it was $12 million um, that was the cost of Matthew. Uh, I don't know how much of that we took from the general fund balance. I think it was a little over half. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing $8 million. Uh, we also hit some of the other funds like the waste management fund fund balance where we could and it was appropriate. Uh, and that was part of what, you know, Mr. Leahy's concern was when he put the April 10th budget together, and he really wanted us to highlight that in the presentation, was that, uh, you know, we are coming into hurricane season. We think it, you know, from what they're saying, it can be an active season, and we're certainly sensitive to that. So we hope the position freeze not only could mitigate against the possibility of revenue loss, but also create funding that we could use to offset uh, a hurricane in the, uh, event that occurs. <clears throat> Councilmember Hanley, do you have an additional question or comment? Uh, no, he answered it. Thank you very much. Councilmember Moss, and then after Mr. Moss will be Councilmember Wooten. I want to address the fundamental question, the guidance. If, and in, in this context, if not for the leadership that was exercised by Councilmember Tyler, Abbott, and myself last Thursday, we wouldn't have been receiving the letter that we got that Thursday until that would have been the letter we would have been discussing this Tuesday. And I mentioned it in this context, because what this process has really done, because you got to, yes, the staff has time to produce what the mayor and the vice mayor want us to vote for, but where is the staff time for the people now who have information that they didn't have until today to say, I want to present and have the staff work on an alternative set of ordinances? and have them ready and published and out for the public in time for a vote Tuesday. Because I've said from the beginning, we have had the fewest number of workshops in the most stressing financial condition during my 17, 18 years on city council. This is, we had one last Thursday, we're having one today, and then we're really having one on Thursday again. But what we're really hearing is, Hey, and Lester's on the margin, really this thing, we ran out the clock so that we get what we wanted. And really there isn't really truly any time to engage the public. Isn't any time for people to generate truly alternative ordinances and present an alternative budget. The, the inertia of the bureaucracy has just run out the clock. I'm glad we had a meeting last Thursday, which wasn't being called for by the mayor, wasn't gonna happen or we wouldn't have known what we know then, we would just be learning on Friday. So this has not been a process that has been overly uh, transparent to the public, I do not believe. I've never believed in the shop around to find six votes. I've, I've always said, so I understand that's how it works, but doesn't work to advantage of the public, that funding formulas work great and overfund things when times are good, and funding formulas are horrible when times are bad because you underinvest. I don't know that it was the right choice to ask the schools to eat what they did because of the funding formula. We never had a discussion to say, are there things less important 
on the city side of the ledger than our kids. They'll never be in that fifth grade again. They'll never be in that kindergarten again. But we didn't, we didn't decide that the risk that we're imposing on, because we don't know what it is, we don't know the consequences of that, but it's the funding formula. So it just goes through a crank without any mental effort, and here's your bill. But we as the council are supposed to be the deciders of the allocation of risk, because that's what adopting a budget does. You're allocating a scarce resource. I don't know to this day that we shouldn't be talking about, is there something on the school side that we really want to restore? Maybe there's not. And we'd give up something on the city side to get it. We just stand behind and say, it's the funding formula. And then in good times, they get money that they don't need and they buy things we don't shouldn't be buying. So that's the consequences of a funding formula. I like what last Thursday, I believe Councilman Rouse talked about, because I believe in that we should be putting the stove pipes aside, the funding entitlements aside and saying, these are unusual circumstances and we shouldn't let, except for the enterprise funds, which have certain revenue bonds and things behind it, which, but all these other self-imposed stove pipes should be like cut down with a chainsaw, so to speak, and we should be looking and putting the money, no matter how it's generated or where it was previously put trustee accounts or prior obligations and say, this is the crisis. What are our top priorities really? And, and, and put the money in the right place. Where, do, where can we not buy back a, a mistake? Maybe that is schools. So that when someone talks about these funding formulas, that's a road to ruin in hard times because you make bad decisions because you're letting them a, a mathematical expression making them rather than understanding the fundamental risk you are accepting when you just blindly follow a formula. In my offsets, I didn't take a single nickel from the school. I balanced it, as Mr. Bradley said, all on the city side, because I think we're, it's much easier for us to reconstitute what we lose on the city side than it is to reconstitute because you can't get that kid's year back in school. That's a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's like that hotel room. You can't, once it's not rented, you can't get that room night back. Once that year is over, the kid never gets that year back. So, and so I think that's what's missing. So I think there's no opportunity hardly, though I'm gonna work hard at it, to get an alternative budget that I think is better than this hybrid budget so that the public can see what the choice is. So the staff be forewarned, it's mostly gonna fall in Dana's lap, I suspect, but I'm gonna to try to, over the next couple of days, put together, I wasn't planning to do this, but since we're on a path that I find just unacceptable, the people need to know there's a better choice and a vote on the 12th. And if we want to, we can vote for the school budget. We can have a separate ordinance and do all that and get all the legal compliance that Mr. Wood is looking for. But I can tell you many cities and it's out there have not done it because why? To get the right answer. And if you ever had a reason to, you know, to do the right thing, it's when you have this COVID crisis that imposes uh, a, a set of decision making that we're not comfortable yet with. So, uh, yes. So if we want to, and that's the issue, hey, we can throw out appropriation or and just adopt the school budget and not adopt our own. That's a possibility. It's not beyond to make that a severable vote. Not easy to do on paperwork, but it's doable. But don't use it as the excuse that we can't fundamentally have a better discussion and we have to race to the 12th of May when you used everything before last Thursday in the budget, holding no workshops and ran the clock. I mean, I think the public knows that's what's happened. And uh, it's, it's basically you ran the clock out on council's ability to consciously get together and consciously debate and get all the answers that they need. And so, so be it. But I just want you to know, I am going to work on an alternative budget and have it ready. But guess what? They have to be advertised on Thursday. So if we're having a workshop on Thursday, how do we meet the advertising requirements for the public before we vote on Tuesday? I have a lot of questions, but uh, I think people can sense that I'm expressing the frustration that the public has, that they've had no real voice and no really transparency on how the confiscation of their revenues is being decided. 
Council Member Wooten and then Council Member Rouse after Ms. Wooten. I just wanted I just wanted to follow up on um, Council Member Wood uh, asking and as well as the mayor asking for direction as to what we want to do um, in terms of voting on the budget on um, Tuesday. Uh, and so uh, I want to make sure that, you know, we are in compliance with the law. I don't want to, you know, um, be out of compliance. Uh, however, I am hoping and looking forward to, you know, the next workshop and also some of the other options that uh, Mr. Moss is talking about reviewing those, making sure we're considering everything. Because I think really the key point here is just options, 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 looking at every alternative in every situation before we say, you know what? No, it can't be done. You know, um, for me, I know there oftentimes I hear what we can't do, but um, at this time, you know, I really want to see what we can do and what the options are, you know, and it's incumbent on me to see what other areas we can look at. Uh, because I, I I do know in this pandemic, in this crisis, you know, uh, the citizens are really looking to us uh, to, to really provide uh, relief and help. And I don't want to uh, dismiss those concerns. I, I take them seriously. And so I think every effort should be made to, to find those opportunities and to find those options. So thank you. Councilmember Rouse. Thank you. Um, just, just want to follow up on a couple of things. First of all, um, I agree with Mr. Moss in the terms of this process. <laughs> I, I, I scratch my head every day at what this process exactly is. Um, but I understand um, the situation we are in and, and I'm willing to adapt um, following our, our conversation on on Thursday, being that that's one that's going to be um, productive. Um, back to my questions about the the general fund um, balance. I understand that, you know it's important um, that we don't go below the threshold of of eight percent to maintain a triple bond rating, triple A bond rating. But and I understand that's one of the factors that's that's conducive to that. I mean, but we're in survival mode. I mean, this is survival mode not only for our city, but most importantly for our residents and for our businesses. Um, here, I understand we're on the cusp of hurricane season, so you know we want to make sure we have um, that those funding and resources in place um, to mitigate um, you know losses. If God willing, we don't have that, but if if so happen we we do deal with a disaster um, of that nature. But what I'm pretty much um, you know asking for is that we open up our our the idea to have an allocation of funds. Um, that we don't have to use, we determine how we use it, but not being afraid to maybe um, dip below that threshold, because this is, again, once again, it's a survival mode. And trust me, when you are hungry and you have to feed your kids and you don't have loaves of bread, you're going to do that. I mean, if you have to, you know, pay your bills, whether it's mortgage or rent or car payment or get on the bus, you going into your savings. I mean, everyone is, is going into their savings. It, it is really survival mode for um, our residents. So I think the last thing on their mind is our triple A uh, bond rating. Um, I understand how important that is, but you know, like I said earlier, if there's any point in time in in our history, and certainly in Virginia Beach's history, um, that our bond rating takes a hit, it would be um, during a, a a world pandemic. And I'm sure shareholders around the world uh, understand that everyone is, is all the economies of the world, no one is immune from um, this pandemic. But uh, as Councilwoman Wooten stated earlier, I think it's important that we give ourselves options um, and, and that we have all our options on table um, to really work this issue and find those credible solutions. Um, and, and lastly, again, the process. <laughs> Um, I won't belabor that point, but there there has to be a, a better way of, of of governing, so to speak. Um, but I do thank all of you all for your input tonight, and I'm looking forward to Thursday, our um, 
hopefully a, a productive conversation. Mayor, it appears that there are no additional council members with questions or comments. No one raised has their, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Wilson, did you have an additional comment or question? Thank you, Amanda. Uh, yes, I just wanted to say uh, just briefly uh, a couple of things that uh, in all the years that I've been on the council, I've never voted illegally uh, on the budget. So voting legally is really important. And one of the reasons that it's important for the schools that we have this budget is because they have to issue contracts for the teachers for the next coming school year. So we wanna make sure that they have their budget in place that they can issue contracts. And, and Councilman Rouse, I, listen, I grew up in a very poor family. I lived in a trailer when I was a kid and I understand what it's like to be poor. And that's why I'm very happy about this new uh, reconciled budget that the mayor and vice mayor did because there are relief funds in there for those people who are struggling. And it's gonna be much better than the 2% that the real estate tax relief would be. There's real, real help for people who are gonna need that. And that's why I think that's a really great alternative. So uh, I am really looking forward to seeing everybody on Thursday, I missed you and it's been really tough staying at home and I'm really looking forward to seeing all of you on Thursday. Thank you. Mayor, it look, it, there's no other uh, virtual hands raised. Okay, thank you and I thank you all for that uh, discussion, much needed. Let me start by saying nobody has been more frustrated than myself over the last couple months in the way that we were compelled to do business. It wasn't all that long ago we had a really good budget that really had a good shot at maybe being a consensus, but then we were thrown one of the major curveballs in the history of Virginia Beach. For a while, our meetings were limited to only things related to the emergency. And then later, you know, we were precluded for safety reasons meeting in personal. And that lack of personal engagement at this table you know, that was always one of our strengths. And over the ensuing months, you know, past months, you know, we've had many long and prolonged discussions at our conference table, you know, flushing things out, discussing ideas, getting to know each other. But that was taken away from us. As I read the opening statement, we talk about the safety of why we were compelled to do it this way. It was extremely frustrating. The virtual meetings satisfy a need, but they're not the most effective and most efficient ways of us communicating. We had two public hearings, though, in regard to the budget that was submitted. After the first one, a reconciliation uh, uh, letter was sent, which took into account a number of the public concerns that we had. And then uh, we also had uh, you know, a discussion among council members the best we could to find out about the individual concerns. And I think in both uh, rec uh, reconciliation letter, it, the best was done to make sure that you know, what was, it represented not just myself and the vice, vice mayor, but other people. There is no perfect budget. It, it's always rough to meet consensus. Negotiation is a part of it. You get some things you want, you get some things you don't. But respectfully, it wasn't until the governor came out last Friday and said that we may have, you know, we are looking forward now to an opening. You know, before that, we were on dead reckoning navigation, trying to figure out which direction we could even go if we would ever be, you know, even be open or how long it was going to be. But now we got a direction. And one of the uh, purposes of setting a, another workshop, now we have at least a indication from the governor that we can resume the council's business. And one of the recommendations I'm gonna make, and I listened to all the conversation today, is to move forward and at least put it on the agenda for this coming Tuesday. Now, we are going to have a meeting a workshop that I called on this Thursday with the intent of bringing us together. 
And one of the items for discussion, and, and believe me when I say I agree, concur 100% with Mr. Rouse, that we have to have a living, breathing budget, and we have to meet monthly to make sure and make those necessary adaptions. We have to be both proactive and reactive. But one of the reasons about bringing it forward, at least on the agenda for a vote on Tuesday, let's remember on Friday, hopefully the city is gonna start being open again for business. So uh, I would like to move forward and put it on the agenda. And once again, let's have that together conversation. And I respect Mr. Moss, you know, allow the opportunity to, you know, come up with alternatives, to have those discussions. But let's have the understanding that going forward, it's going to be incumbent on us to make sure that we adapt and re react to whatever budget situations, economics that we're going to confront it. But at least now we know that we're going to be able to start getting a limited opening of our hotels, our restaurants, our our churches, and, you know, we have a light at the end of the tunnel now that we did not have at this time last week. So that's my recommendation that, you know, we move forward, at least put it on the budget. Let's have the discussion together on Thursday. And, but once again, this thing works out. We're going to have, we're going to be together again for an actual discussion on the budget. So that'll be my recommendation. Um, Mayor, would you like for me to go around and poll council or just going to move forward um i, I know that was the initial it's, it's up to you mr mayor i believe you've heard from the majority of council members but you okay. may do whatever you desire okay i'll tell you what let's ask any council member that you know give them the option to, you know to you know to make it you know give their input i think okay. that would be fair okay i will just do it by roll call council member abbott I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Are, we, are we giving our opinion on whether or not we want to vote on the 12th for the reconcile the reconcile budget? Okay. Um, really so we can make that decision when we are going to have a, co a conversation on Thursday. So I'm going to say no. Council member Berlucci. I think we should have a conversation on Thursday and that we owe it to the people to adopt a, a budget on May 12th if we can. Take that as a yes. Uh, Council Member Henley. I think we need to move forward and put it on the agenda for next Tuesday. Jones. I'm sorry, did you say Jones? Yes, sir. Uh, I see nothing wrong with putting it on the agenda for next Tuesday. Uh, if for some reason we can't gather the votes to pass it, we just have to put it off. But uh, I see I see no reason uh, to take it off the agenda for Tuesday, next Tuesday. Council Member Moss. I will be asking the city attorney to build a product that's severable that allows us in two separate votes that we could vote to approve the school board's budget as required by law, but not act on the city budget. Is that a yes or a, or a no? I'm sorry. People. It's a no, but I'm just letting people know what the product that's produced. I'm asking the city attorney's office to prepare a, a version of that that allows us to adopt the school board budget on the 12th as required by law, but not adopt the appropriation ordinances necessary to fund the city side of the budget and the city side of the CIP. So I'd be making a city and a school board budget a severable question by actual proposal on the agenda. Thank you. Council Member Tower. I would vote uh, no, and I would join Mr. Moss in that, uh, in his severable request. Council Member Rouse. Yes, I agree. We could move forward with adding to the agenda for Tuesday. 
Council Member Wilson? Yes. Council Member Wooten? Yes, I just want to reiterate my comments to move forward with this matter on the agenda. Vice Mayor Wood? Yes. Consensus. Okay, uh, you know, thank, once again, thank council for uh, their discussion and look forward to getting together and further discussions Thursday and then again on Tuesday. Okay, at this point, if we can move forward with the uh, pros uh, resolution or ordinance, and this is an ordinance uh, by uh, Mr. Tower. Ordinance to transfer two million uh, from the tourism uh, program tip fund to the tourism advertising fund tap fund rate increase advertising marketing efforts. Okay, do I have a motion? Councilmember Wilson. Yes. First of all, I want to say I I fully support doing this. I think it's a grand idea. We've got to get people coming back to our city. And uh, I, I totally support it. And I want to thank Mr. Tower, Councilman Tower for doing this. Um, however, I think because it's part of our reconciled budget that we should defer it tonight and put it because it's going to be part of it's part of the budget book for next week. And so I would like to move that we defer this. Uh, we don't really have a date when the beaches are going to open up. Uh, hopefully it's going to be before Memorial Day. But this is part of our reconciled budget, and we shouldn't be having a piecemeal. So I move that we defer this until next week. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Mr. Mayor, I second that. Open for discussion. The motion is to defer to next week. Discussion? Councilmember Jones? Uh, I, I was just going to second the motion, but Mr. Wood's already done that. Any additional comments or from council members? If you raise your virtual hand, please. I see no one raising their virtual hand, Mayor. Okay, uh, the motion, uh, motion is on the floor to defer the, this item till next week. Could we have the vote, please? I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Councilmember Moss, did you have questions or comments? Hand doesn't work and I didn't get text in time. Thank you, Amanda. I don't know if Mr. Guy had intended to speak, but this is, this is my concern and, and I'm sure everybody uh, different. If there is work, that needs, and I don't know the answers to these questions, but if there is work that be, needs to be done to prepare content so that when we do know the beaches are open, you're now not deciding how to build your message and losing frequent time. So you're doing pre-mobilization, to use a military term, pre-mobilization so that when the time comes to execute, you're pre-positioned with your content versus waiting till July 1st, then you go out and try to create your content, this message about how you're going to be safe here and all those things. And then you lose two or three weeks while you do the things that they do to create that focus groups. If this is what this purpose of the money is, which I think it is, and Mr. Tower can talk more of that and so could the industry. Well, then what you're really doing is you're making what you do after the 1st of July less effective because it arrives and gets ready to go out there and when people have already made their decisions of what they're going to do and you're missing that so to think that reconciliation so you're getting one thing a process improvement so you think but you're really losing the effect you're wanting to have for the businesses and you don't have to know the exact date when they're opening in order to build the content that you want to communicate to the public while they're planning their events, if they're able to afford a vacation, and you're able to get the message across with, you know, I heard the Starbucks, hey, it's a familiar place because you've been here before. It's a safe place. This is why it's safe. This is all the things that we're doing. That takes time to build content that's effective. So if you're going to wait till July the 1st, 
you and thinking that's when you're going to be able to have the money award the contract put it in place have the deliverable you'll be delivering your message in the last two weeks if you're lucky of july or you're going to put out something that hasn't been well thought out because you're rushed to get there so this may be a case of penny wise and pound foolish i would defer to the people that i've heard from the industry who thinks we need to be developing the content and then you use the money in July to buy the messaging, but even then I suggest that might be a little bit late. But I think you need to understand what it takes to produce the content and how it has to be market tested before you deliver it and deliver it in a time frame when people are making the decisions to go on vacation if they can afford it. And I and I think when the beaches are open has nothing to do with that preparation of having that information and that kind of content in the can and ready to go. But I would defer to Mr. Tower to substantiate my thoughts and what I've heard from the uh, resort industry down there at the oceanfront, because he's much closer to it than I. Councilmember Tower, and then after Mr. Tower will be Councilmember Wooten. Uh, thank you. I, I, uh, it, John stated it well. I think this is a, an unnecessary delay. A lot of people have spent a lot of time in the industry, and, and it's more than simply developing the content. It is necessary to develop the content, to uh, tentatively line up diff different ad buys and the like, but th this has to be a coordinated campaign, not it has to involve folks from the city. It has to involve the hotel industry. It has to involve the restaurant industry, the attractions, the other uh, parts of the of the uh, tourism industry that have been affected. And why delay it for a week? If everybody is in favor of it, this is money that is in this 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 year's budget. Where we are now. It, and and we are moving. It's clear from the governor's uh, saying that he's getting ready to move into a phase one, and we've made every effort. And I thank the mayor very much for his contribution to that in urging the urging the governor to open the beaches, which is uh, an Im important way to do it. But we we need to develop content that makes the beach. Uh, uh, a, we need to develop the processes and the content to match that shows that the beach, it will be a leader in uh, health and safety of any beach anywhere in America. By the way, the beaches in South Carolina and in Maryland will be open before our beaches uh, in any event. So we, we will be working from behind to begin with. Uh, a, a group of the CVB folks have done a great job in coming up with a plan. The hotel association, the restaurant association, and a group of other stakeholders, including some really first class professional people who've donated a lot of time and energy uh, into this project. I am no marketer, I'm no advertiser, I'm no tourism uh, guru. But I can tell you a lot of people have dropped everything they've done to get ready to try to develop this content and this plan as quickly as possible. And I, I do not see the reason for delaying it. Okay, uh, Mr. Tower, you know, this was your, or, uh, your ordinance. Do you wanna make a substitute motion? I have additional, I have an, okay, an additional. Okay, my apologies. Sorry, uh, Councilmember Wooten. Real briefly, I just wanted to say um, that there uh, is a considerable considerable amount of merit to Councilmember Tower's argument and Councilmember Moss's argument regarding this matter. Uh, and it would seem like it would be best uh, to be ready to go when the beach is opened and um, be prepared. And it seems like that's what the resolution is about doing making sure that we're prepared, um, that we send the messaging out, and then people understand it builds up, and then when we're ready to open, uh, everything is in place. And so, um, you know, I would concur with those two viewpoints and um, would certainly like to see the resolution move forward. And I've talked to quite a few of the stakeholders 
you know, who are at the oceanfront and they would like to see uh, whatever the best way to expedite the process uh, concerning the messaging, they'd like to see that happen. And it sounds like council members towers resolution would um, actually address that matter. Council member tower. Student motion that that the uh, ordinance as as submitted be approved. Uh, is there a second on the alternative or substitute? A second. Motion on the substitute. Council member Abbott. I was going to second. Councilman Towers motion, but I think Ms. Wooten did already. Councilmember Moss, did you have a comment or a question? Flo to second the uh, motion, so I, I've had my piece, but thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, uh, Councilmember Wilson. So I just want to make sure I'm clear. We're voting to see if the substitute can be what we're voting on. Or are we voting on the substitute motion as the main motion? We, no, we'll vote. Mr. Attorney, we do, we do the substitute first. I, I think you would have two separate votes. You would vote to, to do the substitute. If the substitute passes, then you vote again to then actually adopt the motion. That's the cleanest and clearest method under Robert's rules. Councilmember Wilson, did you have an additional comment or question? Voting, to, so we're voting to see if we're going to vote on the substitute motion. We we are voting on the ordinance uh, to approve the ordinance as as stated in the uh, substitute motion. There would be two votes. If you vote affirmatively, votes. then you go back, and now the motion on the floor is to approve the item. Uh, Technically, the motion to defer would have been to lay on the table under Robert's rules, and it would have been a separate motion rather than a substitute. So, um, you, you, Mr. Mayor, you could do it either way, but I think for purposes of clarity, the, the cleanest way to do it would be to have two separate votes. Do you approve the substitute? If you approve the substitute, then you vote to adopt it. Okay, so we'll, uh, the first vote will be to ad uh, adopt the substitute. Whether, whether you want to consider the substitute as the main motion. Okay. I, I'm sorry, uh, Councilmember Berlucci has his virtual hand raised. So I believe he wants to make comments or questions. Okay. I just have a question about, um, could you please explain with greater detail exactly what we're voting on? What is the, what is the substitute motion? The substitute motion is to move forward to adopt the um, ordinance? The motion, the original, the main motion on the floor was to defer. There has now been a motion to substitute for that motion, a motion to approve. If you adopt the motion to substitute, then you would still need a vote to approve. So if you vote, if the vote, if the first vote carries, there would be a second vote to approve the item. If the first vote fails, then the second vote would be to approve the motion to defer. Council Member Berlucci. Well, before we move forward to vote, I just want to say that I am in um, complete support of this program, and I recognize the need for um, advertising support to uh, promote our city and the wonderful hospitality in industry that we have. Um, and yet, at the same time, I understand and recognize the need for us to work together as a team in this moment. And my understanding is, is that this is part of our larger uh, reconciliation conversation that will be considered um, next Tuesday. And I think that uh, it's acceptable to me that we um, in incorporate this into the larger strategy for recovery in uh, in Virginia Beach. And so I don't want there to be any misunderstanding about that I uh, support um, this this program, but I think it should be part of our larger comprehensive discussion about recovery. And so that I will not be supporting the substitute motion at this time. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions from council members? If so, raise your virtual hand. 
Mayor, I see no one raising their virtual hand. Okay, Mr. Leahy, did you have any uh, comment or clarification? <clears throat> well, I've been informed by um, uh, Deputy City Manager uh, Ron Williams that the actual content uh, work is already underway in anticipation uh, because they did not want to be in a position where um, once this was approved, you had a long delay in preparing the content. So the content work is underway, uh, and I just, uh, since that was a point of discussion, it needs to be every, clear in everybody's mind. Okay. So at this point, uh, let's Sorry, start. I have. Yeah. Uh, Vice Mayor Wood, did you have your hand raised? Did you have comments? No, Mr. Leahy answered my question. Um, and then um, Council Member Tower, did you have additional comment? I do. Um, I'm not sure what the purpose of the uh, of Mr. Williams' comment, if it was that there is no need to approve this motion at this time because the content work is already under the way, or whether it's underway and uh, we need to approve this with all due <laughs> speed. Uh, I'm not sure what the thrust of the comment was. In any event, I see. I continue to see no reason why it can't be approved today. As far as I'm concerned, the only reason it's being delayed is as some kind of leverage to uh, for the vote on the on the uh, on the on the reconciliation letter that's in front of us, and I don't particularly appreciate it. But I'll uh, I'll, I'll live with the results, whatever they are. Council so member. Moss, did you have additional comments or questions? I do. It, it, it continues to surprise me on uh, our completed staff work, how incomplete it all so often seems to be, because I don't know why we couldn't have been informed, and maybe this was a, a secret Ron was trying to keep, but why, Mr. Witt, why we all don't know. Uh, maybe there's some letter I've overlooked or some memo I didn't I didn't hear, but you would think that part of the staffing the, all this ordinance that we would have this deep background about content being prepared it uh this is how it is what is it you know just it's interesting but what isn't what is interesting is that the peoples whose lives depend upon and their incomes and their employees depend upon uh getting out there early i think they would if we have the content is almost ready then we should be doing what advertising we can do before July 1st. So a question can be answered later is, well, when is this content deliverable due? That's a, a sentence of contract. What's the deliver? When's it due? And uh, when will council get a preview of it? That's another question, another milestone. And when, based upon the deliverable of the preview, when could we go to market before July 1st if we had the money and wouldn't that and just those kind of questions, but maybe sometimes that's just too much to expect. But nonetheless, I am posing those questions now, and I do think that uh, Councilman Tower is correct, but I understand there's other, other issues at hand, and I think the public and the people who are in the industry and who are watching will, will understand the chemistry of what's taking place, and I leave it to their judgment. Thank you. Councilmember Wilson, and then after Ms. Wilson, it'll be Councilmember Tower. Well, there was um, information in our package of the plans and the programs that they were planning on how they were spending this money. And it, it was readily available uh, to all of us. And I think they're going to be, you know, it's going to be starting right away. It's not going to be waiting until July. So, uh, or the middle of July. So this is, this is all ongoing. And like uh, Deputy City Manager William said, this is being prepared and it will be ready and the money will be available as soon as we vote on it next week. Thank you. Council Member Tower. I just make one additional comment. We're not talking simply about planning for advertising when the beach is open. We are talking about advertising leading up to that time. There is one kind of advertising you would do to, you know, uh, for our brand, if you would, uh, while we are waiting to open, there's another kind of advertising that's probably the most important type about that will emphasize 
that we are opening and the say and what we are doing to make this a safe and healthy activity and place to go and then there is an advertising program that will definitely carry on from that that's been developed over a longer period of time in anticipation of the summer and before the before the covid attack so it is a coordinated campaign it's extremely important that it be a coordinated campaign. Uh, in fact, I, I'd like to, the city has um, had a consultant, his name's Bill Hanbury, he's a very accomplished guy. Everybody on council has met him, I think, and talked with him, and at least heard him talk. And I'd like to read what he has said about this process. He said, destinations will need to adapt to a new reality concerning how to accommodate visitors when they decide it's time to start traveling again. Safety will outweigh all other factors, including price and geographic proximity. How a destination presents its various tourism products as safe to visitors will be the difference between success and failure. Hotels, restaurants, attractions, event venues, transportation assets, and retail will need to collaborate at unparalleled levels to assure consumers that the entire tourism value chain is safe and secure. A coordinated destination approach will be the winning formula. Uh, everybody that I've talked to agrees that that is true. Uh, we we know ourselves how difficult it is to coordinate di differing points of view, differing aspects, small businesses, large businesses, uh, different. I just urge us to get on with this and do it. I don't see any reason to delay. I, I don't need to repeat that again. Thank you. After Mr. Rouse, is Councilmember Henley. Just want to voice my support um, for Councilman on. Um, Towers ordinance. Um, one thing I think is really readily, readily um, important is that we we still are competing. We still are competing um, not only for our, our market share, um, to, but to be that destination that when the emergency response is lifted or eased in any way, uh, form or a fashion, that we are ready ready to go to make up those lost revenues and salvage what we can. Um, from the, the bit of our tour season, um, but we we gotta get on board. We gotta adapt, um, and we have to act. And now is the the, the time um, to act to make sure that our brand is always at the forefront of those would be travelers and families that want to find uh, a safe and healthy um, destination, such as uh, Virginia Beach. So um, again, a large. A lot of talk has been surrounding the budget and, and revenues and uncertainty. Um, we need to make sure we put in place um, the necessary uh, steps to be um, successful whenever we um, come out of this COVID uh, emergency um, response, so to speak. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Henley and then Councilmember Tower. Well, I I'm just confused because I'm looking at the April 30th operating budget and CIP reconciliation letter, which we had last week. And if we were to do this as a separate process, we're, we're not following this rather lengthy discussion for how we're gonna be balancing the TIP and the TAP funds in two phases. So this ordinance doing it tonight kind of pulls forward that and it just seems to me that we're supposed to be adopting this plan as it's described in this april 30th letter to uh, take money from the tap fund or rather the tip fund to balance the tap fund i think it's all a part of of this uh two paragraph discussion uh, that's in the april 30th letter so i just see it as a part of the reconciliation and and I, I'm, I was not uh, supportive of something earlier we did that piecemealed these kinds of things. I really think we have to look at all of it together. And I, I really don't know why we should be pulling forward 
the phase one uh, before the phase two, but the phase one is also dependent on these other explanations and in, in balancing these funds. So I just see it all as a part of that. And it would be what we should be doing as a part of this reconciliation next Tuesday. And I certainly don't see it holding up anything. I think it's just making this a two phase project, which is what was proposed and that's what we need to stick to. Mayor, I do not have anyone else with their virtual hand raised. Okay, uh, the substitute motion is on to make the um, ordinance uh, by Mr. Tower the primary uh, ordinance that, uh, uh, for the vote. Okay, let's go for the vote. Councilmember Abbott? Aye. Councilmember Berlucci? No. Councilmember Henley? No. Councilmember Jones? No. Councilmember Moss? Aye. Councilmember Tower? Aye. Councilmember Rouse? Aye. Councilmember Wilson? I suppose. <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat, Ms. Wilson? Ms. Wilson, could you repeat your vote? Councilmember Wilson? I'm not sure. Councilmember Wooten? Aye. 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 Vice Mayor Wood? No. Councilmember Wilson? Councilmember Wilson? No. 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 Thank you. Mayor Dyer? Aye. Yes? Yes. Um, the main motion, the substitute motion has been approved six to five. Okay, now we move to vote on the motion. No, now we uh, the move on on the motion. Okay. Councilmember Abbott? Aye. 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 Councilmember Berlucci? While I would have heard a collaborative uh, technique as part of the reconciliation, I support this measure. And I will vote yes. Councilmember Henley. I'm just very uh, uh, disappointed that we're not following our reconciliation plan, and I'm going to vote no. Councilmember Jones. Hi. Wish that we would follow the plan that we're supposed to follow, and I'm, I'm going to vote no as a protest to the procedure. Councilmember Moss. Uh, Council Member Tower. Aye. Council Member Rouse. Um, I'll vote in uh, support of this, but as Councilwoman um, Councilman Jones and Councilwoman Hanley stated, the the process again. I, I what is the process? What is the proper procedure? But um, I do support this ordinance. Councilmember Wilson. I think it's wrong that we didn't follow our process, but I'm not going to vote against funding for the um, for the advertising for our for our tourism. So I vote yes. 
Council Member Wooten. Uh, I certainly agree with the process. Uh, however, in terms that has been expressed uh, by Council Member Tower and the urgency of the need, uh, I'd like to support this measure. So, yes. Wood. Well, I think it's absolutely out of order, but I'm not going to vote against the, the funding, so I'd say yes. Mayor Dyer. By a vote of nine to two, you have adopted the ordinance to transfer $2 million from the Tourism Investment Program Fund to the Tourism and Advertising Program Fund. Uh, Ray, increased advertising and marketing efforts. Okay, prior to adjournment, you know, I feel I owe an obligation for my yay vote on that. And I truly appreciate all the work that, you know, we've been putting into reconciliation. I have had a number of conversations in terms of, you know, trying to get the city open and talking to the hotel owners and the restaurant and the tourism folks about their, their plight. And I didn't want to send a message that, you know, they are indeed not a priority. And I think, you know, the council, you know, was divided on this. But I just think, you know, and once again, you know, this is the opportunity because, uh, you know, since uh, the staff will be working on any adaptions coming up with the uh, reconciliation for Tuesday, you know, I, you know, like I said, my heart goes out, you know, to a lot of the folks that are having a tremendous amount of struggles right now. And we are going to be opening and we are going to bounce back. And I just felt I just, you know, in all honesty, had an obligation to show support for the industry. And I know some council members might be disappointed with me, but, you know, so I got to vote my conscience. And, but thank you all. You know, this was a long and productive meeting. We are adjourned.